Hey, Bestish B here for 64K and welcome to my new video, The History of RK Gaming. Arcades. The Universal Language. 1970-1999. And welcome back. So in this video special, I'm going to be taking a trip down memory lane and reliving the origins as well as the best years of the video game arcade scene. We're going to start with video games humble beginnings and the birth of the arcade scene in the early 1970s. A jump through the golden age of arcade gaming in the 1980s. And of course, arcade's big resurgence in the 1990s. And I've also gathered up a bunch of guests from all over the world, people from different facets of video gaming, and they'll be sharing their arcade experiences from their point of view, as well as my own. So, let me introduce them. Hi, thanks for having me on today. I really do appreciate it. Hi everyone, I'm Darren Borg, or Daz, as some people know me from the Hands On Gaming podcast. Hi, I'm Mark Halliwell from Yorkshire in England. Although some of you may know me under my handle, which is Judge Drock. Hey guys, it's Brian from Brian's Man Cave. Hi there, I'm Audie Surly from Norway. Hey guys, my name's uh, Sean or Texas, my friends call me. And hey, I'm Best HB. If you're new here, I run the 64K YouTube channel dedicated to the Commodore 64 and all other retro gaming goodness. Hi, I'm John Linneman with Digital Foundry. Okay, perfect podcast and the Retro Domination podcast. I'm Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Thanks to Best HB for uh, inviting me to this little video. <laughs> And I was the founder of the Amiga Demo Team Anarchy, which started in 1989. Member of Sakai Project, Digital Foundry, and I totally did not forget to film my introduction months ago, and then did it now, many months later. I was asked by the 64K YouTube channel about video gaming in Canada. I'm from the United States. Born and raised in Rockford, Illinois, in the Midwest, near Chicago. I originally used to live in South Africa. That's where all my arcade gaming experience comes from. So I said, sure, pass along some questions. But currently living in Tucson, Arizona, and I spent a lot of time in arcades as a kid. I was a Commodore 64 fanatic, grew up with the machine. Uh, about some of the history of uh, my arcade days. And I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I grew up in the arcades of the 1970s. Currently though, I now live in Canada. I love all games today. And I come from the United States. And this is part two of a three-part video series. This covers 1980 to 1989. And now let's go back to the 1980s, an era which myself and most of my guests just soaked up. The golden age of arcade gaming. After the earthquakes and tidal waves, they won't be quite the human beings you remember. They'll be more tractable, easier for you to rule in the name of Ming. You mean slaves? Let's say they'll be satisfied with less. With the popularity of disco finally starting to wane and technology leaping ahead year by year, it was inevitable the arcades would reach their pinnacle in this decade. The time of big hair and access. If the 70s was the invention of video games, then the 80s would be that vision finally coming to fruition. And it was all on the back of pinball, whose three balls equals three lives, flashy lights and sounds, and high scores equals extra lives had all been translated into the new video medium. But this is where video arcades would leave the pins in the dust and be the go-to entertainment for the kids of the 80s. The 
1970s pushed technology further with almost every game release, and in turn 1980 would bring many new features to arcades that will become standards for years to come. The Deco cassette system was developed by Data East as a standardized arcade system making it possible to load different games from cassette into arcade RAM chips, thus allowing you to change out games daily. The games took on average a few minutes to load, just like old cassette gaming on my beloved Commodore 64. Roughly 40 to 50 games were released this way up until 1985 before the system was discontinued. Some notable game releases on the system were Lock and Chase, Burger Time, and Burning Rubber. Another new introduction was synthesized voices or samples into a game called Speak and Rescue as it was called in Japan. This game was later released as Stratovox by Taito in North America. It's a simple variation on a bit of Space Invaders and Galaxian styles, but the inclusion of voice samples made it a first for arcade games, and it would become more and more popular as the 80s progressed. We had an arcade in the neighborhood that was about a maybe a three or four minute bike ride away. It was called Just For Fun and it was an absolute blast. This was probably 1980, 1981, 1982, right in that range that I spent a lot of time down there. And I distinctly remember busting into the piggy bank and taking out exactly 100 pennies and putting them in like a Ziploc bag, bringing them down to the arcade, putting them on the counter. and at this arcade, they used tokens instead of quarters. So we get 10 tokens for a dollar. I could play for an hour or so on those. It was an absolute blast. They would look at me funny when I brought them all the pennies though. Now let's flip our attention to the games of 1980 and first up was Phoenix, published by Taito in Japan. Another one of my dad and I's favorite games to play together. It's a space shooter in the Galaxian mold, but still different and unique in its own right. Featuring five stages, we have to blast alien Phoenix birds or eggs before they hatch. You are also equipped with a shield which can be activated to save you from fire or fry close flying objects. I love the unpredictable nature of the enemy patterns and this game also features one of the first examples of an end of game boss battle where you have to blast a hole right through the final brain aliens UFO. Next was another space shooter in the form of Mooncrester released by Michibutsu, who were founded in 1970 with their headquarters being in Kita, Osaka, Japan. Like so many of these companies before them, they started by selling arcades, but made their official arcade debut in 1978 with a clone of Breakout called Table Attacker. Mooncrester though was one of their first big hits. It featured unique elements like the three pieces of your ship representing your lives, upgrades to your weapons, the further you Got, which involved docking with new pieces to increase your firepower. It was fun, but really hard, and was followed by a bunch of sequels such as 1985's Terra Cresta and a 3D version, Terra Cresta 3D in 1997 for the Sega Saturn, which was their last published game. Midway then gave us Wizard of War developed by Nutting Associates, with David Nutting himself being one of the designers. This unique maze style shooter included a two player mode where you can either team up and kill the creatures or blast your opponent and the monsters, featuring excellent use of speech samples, addictive gameplay, varied enemies and a gradual learning curve made it really fun to get into. I used to play this a lot on my Commodore 64 with my next door neighbor and we absolutely loved it. It was a great conversion. Another game in a similar style but equally addictive was Berserk by Stern. Berserk essentially is a maze shoot em up with the goal of each screen is to kill all the robots as fast as possible and exit the level. Gameplay employs randomly generated levels with you trying to last as long as you can and rack up those points. More kills means the robots get smarter and more aggressive, with the difficulty ramping up pretty quickly. But that one more go trope is alive and well, making it quite an addictive game. Just like a few other games this year, Berserk is absolutely jam packed with speech samples. So as soon as you walked into an arcade back then and heard that crazy robot chatter, you just had to go and investigate. Now let's check out Atari, who had three massive releases this year and coming off their hot streak of Luna and Asteroids in 79. Let's start off with Centipede, another Ed Log design game, which was a single screen shooter where you had a blast a centipede making its way down towards you. You also had to deal with other bugs like spiders, fleas and scorpions, each bringing their own set of problems to deal with. In this fast paced game, the use of a trackball control method was really what made this game stand apart as you could move extremely fast and be very accurate once you got used to it, leading to mega points on the high score table. The game 
almost followed by a sequel, Millipede, in 1982. Missile Command was next, a game designed by Dave Thera, who would do another few big hits for Atari in the next few years. But for now, Missile Command is a fixed screen strategy shooter, where you had to defend your cities from a nuclear attack by shooting down the missiles before they nuked the surface. No doubt inspired by the rising tensions of the Cold War at the time. Again, using a trackball to perfect effect, it was a test of quick thinking and pinpoint accuracy. If all your cities are nuked, it's game over. It's very simplistic and addictive. It's what Atari just did best. And their third game was Battlezone, a first person tank shooter that made excellent use of its 3D vector graphics. The cabinet design really sucked you into the experience with the double control method from 74's tank and that viewfinder periscope you had to look through to play the game. I remember my dad having to hold me up to the viewfinder to play this for the first time. Battlezone was another game that was great. I was only small so I used to have to stand up on a on a step or this crate, uh, milk crate to be able to look through and play Battlezone. And I was completely blown away. I had just watched Tron on VHS, so this was like living the movie. Although it was a few years later, after its release, it was still extremely impressive. In the game, you roam a planet's surface blasting other tanks and UFOs for bonus points. You use the radar to seek and destroy. This game is also notable as being the first big successful 3D game. And not only that, the original first person 3D shooter. And 1980s hits just keep on coming as Namco dropped two classics to round out this year. First was Rally X, a maze style racing game where you had to drive your race car through a maze picking up all the yellow flags while avoiding all the other cars. You had a radar map for help and a smoke screen you could deploy to incapacitate incoming cars at the expense of your fuel tank. The game was very successful in Japan becoming the sixth highest grosser of 1980. But in North America the game was a complete failure, selling less than two 2,500 cabinets. In retrospect though, the game has become very well loved and respected and is included on almost every Namco compilation I can think of. The game is also credited as the first arcade game to have continuous background music throughout play as well as a bonus stage. Both of these things would become standards in almost every arcade game over the next couple of years. And now the big one. Pac-Man, a game like Space Invaders that became a complete pop culture phenomenon. It was Namco's first major hit, and it was a game by Toru Iwatani who designed Namco's first arcade game, GB, as well as Rally X and Pole Position. He wanted to make something that everyone could play together and attract that non-existent female market to the fold. Simple colorful characters, bubbly sound, and the non-reliance of killing of aliens. Its fun-natured and addictive charm won everyone over. With its simple to pick up and play maze mechanics, catchy music, at least all five seconds of it, and those iconic sound effects, it was an instant smash, at least in the US. It didn't actually fare that well initially in Japan, the complete opposite story of Rally X. The media had an absolute frenzy with this game. It even spawned its own record release with Pac-Man Fever. The game was basic and addictive, eat all the pellets in a level while avoiding the ghosts, eat a power pellet making the ghosts vulnerable, buying you time to either finish off a level or eat the ghost as bonus points. It was this addictiveness that managed to bring in the female audience as well as everybody in between. Video games are the fastest growing new form of entertainment in America today. People are pumping millions of quarters into video games across the nation each and every week. We spoke to some local players and asked them why. Well, I like them because it works with the mind and it just inspires me. Well, it does. In what ways? It makes me feel good, just that I can win. It's also cited as the first game to have cutscenes between certain levels, as well as establishing the now time-honored tradition of a mascot character for a certain company.
Western developers may have invented the video game, but it was clear even by 1981 that the Japanese arcade companies were starting to dominate the scene by really pushing the technology and gameplay ideas to the limits and leaving the Western companies as a distant second to their own creations. There were many new innovations as well, propelling the games to go beyond the one screen approach and open them up to all sorts of adventures, maybe partially inspired by the computer RPG scene at the time. Growing up in America, we had all of the traditional arcade games. They were pretty popular. We had traditional pinball tables, traditional arcade games. Certain games, the title screens obviously were in Japanese and I didn't know what these games were called. And we were fairly well isolated from what else was going on in the rest of the world. Only in like the last five years or so did I find out that a game I played in the 80s which I absolutely loved and I always try to figure out what it was. I could never find it because there was no internet. Now obviously we knew that Pac-Man and Space Invaders and all those, they came from Japan. They were Japanese games, but you know, they were the English translations of them. And we really didn't think that much about foreign games back in the early to even the mid 80s. The game in question was Capcom's Speed Rumbler. I played that so much in the arcade, but I Every version I played in South Africa was in Japanese and so I never knew what that game was called. I only found out a few years ago that it was called Speed Rumbler. It's probably the mid to the late 80s before we started really thinking about, you know, oh, what's going on in another country? What are, what are these uh, games showing up in other countries that maybe we don't have access to? As far as gameplay goes, it, you know, the language barrier was never an issue. So let's first check out a bunch of interesting space shooters for this year. First up was Gorf, released right at the beginning of 81 by Midway. It was, in a sense, a fixed screen shooter, but it had a lot of elements that set it apart from the rest. The game featured five distinct levels that changed up gameplay, in each giving the game the honor of being the first arcade game to feature multiple screens in one game. It also featured heavy use of digital speech, which was a real attention grabber. For me though, I always felt like Golf was the first official parody game of sorts. Long before Konami's Parodia series got going, this game took pot shots and jokes at Space Invaders, Galaxian and many more. It was clear they were having a lot of fun with it and it really adds to its charm. Gameplay is also really solid over all the levels, making this an often forgotten gem. Next, SNK released Vanguard, a multi-directional shooter similar in look and style to Scramble. But the game would go from vertical to horizontal and even diagonal which was unlike any game at the Time. It was a fun shooter featuring some great boss battles and another large dose of speech and music samples, illegally ripped from movies of the time, like the first Star Trek film and Flash Gordon. It also received a sequel in 1984, but it's nowhere near as good as this one. Next, Sega gave us Astro Blaster, a fixed screen shooter where you have to blast waves of different enemies while making sure you don't run out of fuel or overheat your lasers. It uses tons of speech samples again and no matter what arcade you went into, if this was there you could always hear it a mile away. This game was clearly the inspiration also for 1982's Activision release Mega Mania on the Atari 2600. Next we got the second game from David Thura who did Missile Command. This one was Tempest, published by Atari. This is another fixed screen shooter that employs full color vector graphics, which was a first. The game also lets you choose your starting level, which is kind of like a difficulty setting, which was a first for an arcade game that I ever played anyway. Tempest is all about blasting everything that comes down a tube towards you and it's simply about seeing how long you can last and therefore how much points you can rack up. The knob control scheme was also extremely accurate making this game an absolute blast to play in the arcades. Next we flip over to Williams who not only gave us one classic but its sequel as well in the same year. Both these games were designed by programmer Eugene Jarvis who had worked in Williams' pinball division before taking his shot with his first video game. Defender. It was a side-scrolling shooter where you had to stop a bunch of aliens from abducting the citizens as well as blast all incoming enemies on your radar before going on to the next level. You had lasers, a hyperspace jump similar to asteroids and a smart bomb which just blew up everything on screen. It was a really hard game which required quick reflexes and the mastery of its unique control scheme. It really was a game for the arcade veterans to sink their teeth into. It became a massive hit, the biggest Williams ever had 
market, with them selling over 55,000 cabinets and it becoming one of the highest grossing arcades of the golden age. It inspired many clones on the old microcomputers, including Drop Zone, a personal favorite, and Activision's Chopper Command. Eugene didn't waste any time and in late 1981 we got the sequel named Stargate. To me this is more of a remix or special edition than a real sequel, but it does improve on Defender in my humble opinion. It adds a whole bunch of new aliens to take out, has an invisible cloaking device added, and also has these stargates that appear where you can walk to the nearest in distress human, as well as bonus stages that are an absolute blast literally where you just shoot hordes of aliens swarming around you in a frantic bid to survive. Stargate is awesome, it's often forgotten, but I think it's a much better game than the original. And if you're looking for home ports, most of them simply go under the name Defender 2 and drop the Stargate name altogether. We'll be seeing lots more of Eugene on this list in the next decade or so. Namco also had a double dose of space shooters on offer, one a sequel and the other an original. The sequel in question was Galaga, the second part of the Galaxian Saga. The game is very much like the original, just with much improved graphics and sound. The action also flows much better in its 255 levels plus bonus stages, and the enemies having the ability to steal your ship, which is one of its most unique features. The game was created using Namco's new arcade board dubbed the Namco Galaga. How's that for originality? And it was also used on our next game, Bosconian and Dig Dug. The game remained in the top 10 arcade money earners right up to 1987 in North America. The other Namco game, Bosconian, was a multi-directional shooter the first of its kind, where you had to fly in all directions taking out ships, missiles and huge space bases. The game had a similar feel and even map as Rally X, at least that's what it always reminded me of. It's also loaded with speech samples, as was the trend of the time. It's not as widely remembered as Galaga simply because Namco had a shortage of those machines due to its high popularity, resulting in them converting many Bosconian cabinets to Galaga ones, making the game harder to find and play. It was definitely in influential though. You can just look at games like Sinistar, Time Pilot, and even Last Mission as examples of Bosconian's legacy. Now let's jump gears to Konami who gave us some of their most well-known Golden Age games. First was Frogger, a simple game where you had to get a frog safely across the road and a river to its home. Do this multiple times and it's off to the next level. Konami had real trouble trying to find distribution for this game outside of Japan. Due to its subject matter being about a frog, absolutely nobody was interested. Luckily for them though, Sega stepped up and distributed it in North America and Europe, and the game turned out to be an unexpected hit. Just like Pac-Man before it, it managed to bring in a large female gaming base, which ended up landing the game in the top 10 earners for 1981. There are currently over 30 different versions of this game, ranging from PlayStation, Dreamcast and Game Boy, and so much more. Konami's second game was Scramble. Like most early Konami games, it was distributed by different companies worldwide, like Layjack in Japan and Stern in North America. The game was a side-scrolling shooter, in a sense, although you weren't only just shooting and dodging stuff, but bombing specific fuel towers to keep your ship going, as it's endlessly running down on gas. The game is made up of six sections that change as you cross a certain line. There's no real stopping. It just keeps going like an endless runner until the last section where you have to take out the enemy base and then the game goes into a loop. I used to love finding this one in the arcades. Even though I was playing it much later, around 1984-85, it was still such a blast. And what was really cool about it was that it wasn't too difficult, so one credit equaled a lot of gameplay, which is something that didn't really go together with arcades. The game was a major hit at the time, with 15,000 cabinets being sold in the US alone in its first five months of release. Strangely enough though, despite its popularity, it was only ported to one system officially, which was the Vetrex, but that didn't stop the clones of it popping up on many systems during the early 80s. It was followed quickly by its sequel, Super Cobra, whose difficulty was the complete opposite of Scramble just prepare to die a lot. There were 10 levels in total with a base to take out at the end, pretty much the same as Scramble. And it's fairly obvious the game was a simple mod or remix, just like Williams did with Stargate. But that didn't stop the game from being successful though as it still managed to sell 13,000 cabinets in only a few months after its release, making it a quick and easy money maker for Konami. Two other arcades that were extremely original and bucked the trend of the time were up next. First is a game called Fantasy by SNK. 
Okay, a crazy side scroller of sorts that employed many new gameplay switches, more than any game that came before it. It even had a story set up in the beginning with your girlfriend being kidnapped by a bunch of pirates. The chase is on as you're trying to rescue her with ballooning, jungle, pirate ships and so much more to check out. Most of the gameplay does involve you dodging rather than fighting. It's a very unique and underrated game. Another original release was Venture by Exidy, which is a dungeon style adventure game, at least in looks as you have to traverse an overworld map before jumping into a room and stealing its treasure and blasting anything that moves with your bow and arrows. Each room has a different set of enemies and once the treasure is stolen traps are often set off. It's a strange mix of arcade action and computer RPG style elements of the time making it another unique offering that's well worth checking out if you never have. And our final game for 81 pretty much kickstarted an entire company from a simple let's clone everybody else's ideas to making a genuine original game. The game in question is Donkey Kong and it helped put Nintendo on the map as a real developer. Uh, this one took a while for me to really think about um, because you know there's a lot of genres and stuff but I think I'm just gonna always go back to the same game I always talk about. That's Donkey Kong. That's my go-to game. That's that's when anybody says what's your favorite game I always say Donkey Kong. This game gives me back so many memories of when I was a kid. Uh, again I used to love playing it in the arcade or, well, in the Chuck E. Cheese, and I used to always love playing it on my Intellivision. In fact, I was so excited when I got it on the Intellivision that, you know, I played the heck out of it. Even though it's not the most favorite version out there, and I know it gets a lot of sl uh, flack about, you know, not being the best, it only has the two boards, and, uh, you know, everything doesn't look right, I still enjoyed it, and it, it was like one of the introductions to the platforming style games for me. And of course it brought us Mario into the world. The game itself is considered one of the first examples of a platform game preceded only by 1980's Space Panic. Your goal was to rescue a girl taken prisoner by Donkey Kong. Not only did this game introduce us to Kong, but also its hero, Mario. Who like Namco's Pac-Man would become Nintendo's mascot still to this day. The game featured multiple screens, cutscenes, and tough as hell gameplay. Designers Miyamoto and Yokoi really threw everything at it. From its excellent cartoon style graphics to unique sound effects, it helped save Nintendo financially who were at a tipping point at the time. Its initial 2000 cabinets sold quickly leading them to expand Nintendo of America just to produce enough arcade cabinets to keep up the demand. By summer of 1982 it had sold over 60,000 cabinets in the US alone. The massive profits from this game also set in motion Nintendo starting to develop the Famicom in Japan based on the Donkey Kong hardware. And with that, this brings one of the most memorable years of the Golden Age to a close. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. The magic experts have just created four new games for the Intellivision system. But beware, the magic's demon attack will destroy you. Atlantis will send you to a watery grave. Microsurgeon will put you in the hospital. And Beauty and the Beast will push you right over the edge. Imagic for Intellivision. Created by experts for experts. Yes. 1982 is considered by most as the peak of the golden age of arcade gaming. The US arcade video game market was worth 4.3 billion. Adjusted for inflation, it was roughly 11.5 billion dollars. Hundreds of new arcade games flooded the market. The home systems were also cashing in on the craze with the introduction of the ColecoVision, Atari 5200 and the Commodore 64, all benefiting greatly from conversions of their favorite arcade games appearing in some form or another on those systems. We also got to see the first jump to a 16-bit microprocessor used in an arcade board. It truly was a golden time to be a gamer. The biggest difference for me was graphics and sound. Gameplay, not so much. For me personally, I think the difference between going to an arcade and playing games at home boils down to, apart from the physical aspects of the game, it's down to range and depth. As a kid, the first computer I had was the Commodore 64. When they used to convert, you know, games to old computers like the Commodore 64 and all the stuff that I used to play. The gameplay, generally speaking, you could actually get it to replicate the arcade really well and 
Gameplay is paramount when it comes down to it. I grew up in the 1970s, I saw gaming go from physical sort of toy type games and coin pushing machines to the very earliest arcade coin, you know, what you'd call a coin up. The biggest difference, I think, was waiting for things to load. When I ended up getting the VIC-20 and then the Commodore 64 a few years later, it was even better because then the arcade games looked almost exactly like the ones I grew up with. Graphics and sound don't have to be exactly the same and they can be quite a bit off and you can still get that arcade experience. The home experience at the time was black and white Pong games, which was amazing as a seven, eight, nine, ten year old, just to be able to play something on a TV screen. But as, as things developed and the arcades became more sophisticated and the machines became more impressive, you went from things like Space Invaders and then on to things like Ghosts and Goblins. If it was a great conversion, um, you got to, you know, you got the sense of the arcade game there, which was great because uh, it felt like you were able to pl play it at home and not have to wait wait six months to go on holiday to play it. Like Miss Pac-Man here on the Commodore 64, this, that's, that thing is absolutely beautiful, absolutely perfect. The biggest difference was obviously the arcades were vastly superior to anything you could get at home, graphics and sound wise. You could think of them as, you know, in modern terms, as high-end PCs, as high as you can possibly get, that were always being upgraded. And in that sense, no home stuff could keep up with it because it was always just ahead by a long shot back then at least. Home uh, gaming um, counteracted the arcades by offering more depth of experience simulations from, you know, war games, card games, adventure games, things that you'd sit in front of for hours. Obviously the music was different, the graphics were different, sometimes the playability. It felt like you were more part of some of these games, you know, because the visuals and the sound was so good. And then you got your downgraded version, you know, on your Atari 2600 or your C64, whatever you played it on. Uh, those weren't necessarily bad by any means. Some of them were actually even better when it came down to it. Uh, not very often, but some of them were. I loved it back then. It was the best thing you could get. So you, you didn't worry about it too much. It was, uh, it was all fun of having something similar to the arcade game. That was, that was the main thing. Completely different experience to the arcades where you'd walk in with a handful of 10 pence coins if you lived in England, fire your three coins in, lose your lives, move on to the next machine. You wanted to, you know, play every machine in the arcade every time you was there. Or at least I did. So let's first take a look at some of Sega's diverse selection of titles. Zaxxon was released in the arcades at the tail end of 1981 by the soon-to-be arcade giants, Sega. Sega had up until that point a number of successful arcades, but Zaxxon would up the ante and put them at the top of the heap of one of the most popular arcade manufacturers of the 1980s. Not much is known about the development of Zaxxon itself, but it's often referred to as Sega's answer to Konami's scramble which itself was a massive arcade hit in 1981. The game was developed by two teams, one being Ikigami Sushinki and Sega's in-house development team in Japan. It was completely unlike any shoot-em-up out there at the time, choosing to take an asymmetric viewpoint of the action, making the game immediately stand out from the crowd and giving the sense of 3D to the genre. The goal of the game is to fly over an enemy's base and shoot the hell out of everything, destroying as much of their base as humanly possible. Like Scramble, you are constantly constantly running out of fuel, so you have to blast those fuel tanks to keep your ship afloat. You also have to use your shadow on the ground to determine how high and low you are, and use your lasers to shoot through the gaps to determine if you're in the right position to navigate through those small openings. You also get to fly through space, which are segues to the last part of the base where you face off against a giant boss character, Zaxxon itself. It's a pretty simple game concept in retrospect, but the extremely detailed asymmetric graphics with the bright blues and reds really caught your are back then, and was one of the reasons that I actually gravitated to the arcade back in the day in the first place. Zaxxon also has the honor of being the first arcade game to get a TV commercial produced for it by Paramount Pictures. In the two-dimensional world of video dots and dashes, flat blips and formless blobs, one video arcade game soars a dimension above the rest. Zaxxon! Experience the control as you climb and dive. Feel the power as you attack and evade. Discover a new level of excitement with the true feel of action in three dimensions. 
Zaxxon, from the master design engineers of SEGA. It no doubt helped out the game to become the massive hit that it was, and in the top 5 money making arcades in 1982 in the US. Sega did however make use of the arcade engine for a couple of other releases, most notably Congo Bongo in 1983. Another very unique title was called Super Locomotive, a side and top view at the same time train action game. The screen was split into two giving you a bird's eye view to see the block paths and direction, and the bottom half was the action element as you release clouds of steam high and low to take out trains, planes, unfortunately no automobiles. Making it to the next station intact was the goal. I only ever saw this game at one arcade but every time I went there it was still available and played it to death. The game was cloned many times especially on the 80s microcomputers. Commodore 64 had two great knockoffs by programmer Anthony Crowther called Loco and Suicide Express. Both great alternatives to check out seen as the arcade version unfortunately has no official ports. Pango was next, developed by Corland for Sega. Corland themselves later became Banpresto, which later became part of Namco Bandai in 2006. In the game you control Pengo, a crazy little penguin trying to crush these blob creatures that have invaded the Antarctic. Gameplay is fast paced and frantic like a lot of the arcades during this period, with you navigating an ice maze and pushing ice blocks around to crush your foes, or electrocute them with the border of the screen to buy yourself some time. It's a really fun game that requires lightning fast reactions and predicting the patterns of the enemy. It's hard, but once you get into the zone, the game becomes mesmerizing. Another aspect of the game that sticks with you is the music, at least the original music, which is a rendition of an instrumental song from the 1960s called Popcorn. That is an absolute earworm that you'll never forget. There are actually two versions of the arcade, one with that as a theme and another with just original music. My guess is that Sega were afraid of being sued and they re-released the game with the original music to cover their backs. Pingo itself overall has 16 levels of increasing difficulty, with intermission animations every few levels just like Miss Pac-Man. The graphics are simple but good looking with nice colors and animation. It's a tough game initially, but worth the fight to get the flow of its action. If you enjoy these single screen maze arcade romps in the Bomberman style, then Pingo is going to be right up your alley. Sega decided to take a stab at the vector graphic style that Atari seemed to do so well, with Star Trek Strategic Operations Simulator. A game based on the antics of Star Trek, the original TV series. The game, like Super Locomotive, is split into different views, almost like you being a part of the bridge crew of the Enterprise. It's a mixture of fast-paced action and strategy, as you have to defend a sector of space from Klingon attacks. Learning how to use your resources and knowing when to dock at starbases for supplies is imperative to success. It uses full-color vector graphics excellently, is loaded with speech samples, and not only came in a regular cabinet form, but also a full deluxe sit down captain's chair version. I never ran across this version back in the day unfortunately but I did get to meet the OG Shatner himself so who cares. And finally from Sega was Buck Rogers Planet of Zoom, a game also based on a science fiction franchise dating back to 1928 when the character was introduced in an issue of the Amazing Stories pulp magazine. This game's timing is also probably more due to the fact that the recent TV series that ran from 1979 to 81 had just wrapped up and was where I was first introduced to the character. The game is a third person spaceship shooter using a fake 3D sprite base for graphics giving the illusion of 3D action. You can think of it as Sega's precursor to their super scalar games that were coming mid 80s like Space Harrier and Afterburner, blast stuff in space, over planet surfaces and massive enemy bases. It's another fun and frantic see how long you can last kind of games and is a great look into what Sega had just around the corner for arcade fans. Do you play video games? Sure. What kind? Uh, Pac-Man, uh, what else? Saxon, Centipede, uh, Turbo. How much of your annual income do you spend on video games, percentage-wise? Not a whole lot. Taito had a couple of interesting titles. First was Jungle Hunt, a side-scrolling action-adventure game that was released just a few months prior as Jungle King, where you basically played Tarzan. Due to copyright issues though, the game was quickly modified to Jungle Hunt where you had to rescue a girl who had been kidnapped by a bunch of cannibals. 
that old chestnut. There were four different levels, each with their own variations on scrolling action. In its original version, it was released around about the same time as Moon Patrol, and is considered one of the earliest examples of parallax scrolling in a video game, although the credit always seems to go to Moon Patrol, which we'll be looking at shortly. Taito's other game, Frontline, was extremely influential and pretty much kicked off the military top-down run-and-gun genre that would spawn many a beloved game such as Commando, Ikari Warriors and Guerrilla War to name a few. You're a one-man killing machine wiping out bad guys with guns and grenades, fighting your way to enemy bases. You can also jump into enemy tanks and go on a rampage of destruction, taking out anything that crosses your path. The game was massive in Japan but failed miserably in Europe and North America due to its high difficulty. Its influence though, however, on Japanese arcade manufacturers did help cement a completely new genre in gaming. And next was Moon Patrol, released in the arcades by RM in 1982. They would go on to make such classic gems as Zippy Race, R-Top, and In The Hunt. The game was designed by Takashi Nishiyama, who would go on to make another RM classic, Kung Fu Master. And Moon Patrol is widely considered the first 2D game to feature parallax scrolling for its backgrounds. I first played this game in a Holiday Inn lobby while we were on vacation in the early 80s. Damn, remember when hotels actually had arcades? How cool was that? There were about 10 machines in there, but just none of them caught my attention quite like Moon Patrol did. Its gradual learning curve made playing it an absolute joy. Besides that, as a kid I ran into this arcade pretty often and it was always a treat to blow my cash on this gem of a game. As the name suggests, you are a moon cop that patrols the surface of the moon, taking out bad guys and keeping those moon streets safe for everyone, as well as trying to survive the harsh natural hazards on the moon surface. The basic gameplay involves driving along and blowing up spaceships and generally trying to avoid death in all its forms, like pits of doom, landmines, random saucer attacks avalanches, rock outcroppings of death until you get to the next checkpoint, where they'll attempt to throw even more stuff to kill you even quicker. You start off on the beginner's course and if you make it through that, you'll go on to the championship course, which is a death fest filled with tanks, dodgy land speeders and all other manner of murder. The graphics are really impressive for an 82 venture, as is the brilliant use of parallax scrolling in the backgrounds. With excellent animation and the physics of the buggy itself, music is a real treat too and even even though it actually really only has one track, it's great and is a completely unforgettable tune. And like I said earlier, what I like the most about Moon Patrol is its accessibility and its slow ramping up of the difficulty. I mean those arcades were simply made to steal your money. The cheaper and more difficult, and damn there were a lot of those, the faster they made back their cash. But Moon Patrol ramped up nice and slow and actually gave you a chance to learn and enjoy the game before corpsing you in the championship course. The game turned out to be extremely popular and became one of the top five grossing arcades in 1982. It was also ported to every system under the sun from the Atari 2600, the Commodore 64, and even dodgy 80s LCD handheld systems. I definitely recommend giving this game a shot if you haven't. It's simple to play and still every bit as fun as it was back in 1982. Next is a quick look at three deco system releases by Data East. Burger Time is a fun romp where you attempt to put hamburgers together while avoiding enemies. Run over the pieces of the burger to drop them down and stack up the sandwiches. It's simple arcade fun. Burning Rubber was next as it's known in Japan and the version that I played. It was renamed Bump and Jump for North America. Drive your car and smash everybody out of the way or bounce over them or on top of them and you have to watch out for those big large water jumps. It's an extremely fun and simple game. I played it a lot on my Commodore 64 which had a clone version imaginatively called burning rubber. <laughs> it's a blatant ripoff but it's still fantastic. And the last deco game was Lock and Chase which is Daddy East's clone of Pac-Man. It was actually released in 1981 but I wanted to feature it here quickly with these other two. Collect all the coins and the main treasure if you can and escape a level while avoiding the police. It's a fun little addictive variation on the dot gobbling genre. What about when I say Dragon's Lair and Donkey Kong? Uh, video games. Do you like video games? No. Do you play them? No. Why? <laughs> it's a communist plot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Konami, following on the success of the previous year, had two more classics. First up was Tom Pilot, a multi-directional shooter in the same vein as Bosconian. In the game, you are jumping through Tom, rescuing pilots trapped in different Tom periods, six in total from 1910 to 2001. You have to blast a set number of planes in each level before taking out the boss. This was a favorite of mine that I played a lot in the arcades. It was designed by Yoshiki Okamoto, who did this and the upcoming Garus before leaving Konami to join Capcom, where he created countless classic games which we'll be checking out soon. The next Konami release was Puyan, another one I played to death, and another game whose designer left Konami in 1983 for Capcom. He was Tokuro Fujiwara, creator of Commando, Ghosts and Goblins, Resident Evil, actually the list is long and extremely impressive. In Puyan, you take the role of a mama pig trying to defend her kids from a bunch of wills as they descend by balloons to abduct them. You're equipped with a bow and arrows and have to blast them before they reach the top or the bottom of the screen depending on the level. It has really nice and colorful graphics with spot on addictive gameplay and sports an earworm tune as well. It's fantastic. Konami's loss was Capcom's gain. Nintendo was back after 81's blockbuster Donkey Kong. First let's check out Popeye based on the King Features comic strip character who originated in 1929. They used to play Popeye cartoons on South African TV in the mornings and I always used to catch an episode before going to school. The game actually sticks close to the comic and cartoon roots with Popeye the crazy sailor trying to win the love and affection of Olive Oil by catching her hearts. Bluto was also there, Popeye's main rival trying to muscle in on their relationship. Just like the cartoon you can eat a can of spinach and gain superpowers for a short amount of time, giving you the ability to give Bluto a big fat slap in the face. The game featured multiple levels with wonderful sprite based graphics and fun music and sound effects. The original Donkey Kong was actually supposed to feature Popeye characters but Nintendo couldn't secure the license at the time so Mario and Kong were the replacements. This game was also converted by Nintendo in 1983 as a launch game for the Famicom in Japan. Many other versions followed in subsequent years. This was was quickly followed by Donkey Kong Jr. was released in the arcades in 1982 by Nintendo and is a direct sequel to the classic Donkey Kong. Only this time the roles are reversed. Instead of Mario being the hero, he's now the villain, imprisoning Kong with Junior trying to free his dad from Mario's clutches with four stages of brutal difficulty. The Nintendo royalty that worked on this game is quite impressive to say the least. Shigeru Miyamoto was the director as well as performing graphic duties with Yoshio Sakamoto who went on and created the original Metroid game. And to round out the stellar team it was produced by Gunpei Yoko who ended up creating the original Game Boy as well as the Game & Watch series which I actually owned the original Game & Watch version of this game as a kid. This was only Miyamoto's second arcade game as a director and he truly understood the fundamentals of what made an addictive and well designed game even from his early days. The game was extremely popular and it was quickly ported to many home systems of the day including the Atari 2600, ColecoVision, Intellivision and obviously the NES. Namco was still on a roll and gave us three more memorable releases. Pole Position put you in the seat of an F1 racer for a third person racing game, something that changed racing games forever. It also had the distinction of introducing the first 16-bit CPU in an arcade board, thus kickstarting a 16-bit revolution. Race one round in a time trial to determine your position, before going on to the big race based on the real life Fuji racetrack in Japan. It was fantastic and blew every other racing game out of the water making them look pretty primitive by comparison. The game took three years to make as they were constantly changing the hardware until it was finally capable of delivering the vision. It's also an early example of product placement as the signs on the sides of the track were actual real companies and depending on what version you played they had different adverts. The game was a massive success all over the world and in the west it was the biggest earner by the end of 1983 and adjusting for inflation the average coin drop per week in 83 was 25 million dollars roughly $450 per arcade machine. It was followed by a sequel, Pole Position 2, in late 1983. Flipping genres, Namco also gave us Exevious, one of my all-time favorite golden age shoot-em-ups. It was a vertically scroller where you had to stop a bunch of aliens from invading Earth. You had regular fire for flying targets and bombs for dropping on turrets and tanks. I really love the sound in this game, from the monotonous music to those metallic ricochet sounds. It was just brilliant. The game was one of the biggest arcade hits 
Jets and Space Invaders in Japan, but only managed to sell an underwhelming 5,000 plus cabinets in the West, making it a moderate success but nowhere near Japan's popularity. In retrospect though, it's become a well-loved classic worldwide. And lastly from Namco was Dig Dug, a sort of maze action game where you play Doug, a spaceman on a quest to kill all these strange underground creatures for who knows what reason. You are equipped with an air pump that you blast into the creatures and then pump them up till they explode. Yeah, it's pretty sadistic. I think Doug needed some counseling, although it's very satisfying for arcade goers. The wonderful graphics, great musical ditties and sound effects made it an instant smash, becoming Japan's second spot money owner for 82 behind Pole Position. The game was just pure fun with large doses of strategy if you wanted to get far. It did spawn multiple sequels though, but none of them managed to match the success of this one. The final Japanese game we'll look at for this year was Minky Monkey. The game itself is completely forgettable. But what's important was that it was the arcade game debut of Japanese company Technos. They were founded in 1981 and were based out of Nakano, Tokyo. They would go on to define an entire genre of gaming in just a few years time, but more on their story later. Uh, they're fun, they're competition, try to beat the machine, and that's just how it is, fun to come down and play. How do you think video games can help you prepare for other things such as a sports competition or school, things of that nature? Well, get your reflexes quick and able to react real quick. Your emotions, I mean, the way you move faster and think about stuff makes you think faster about what you do. Now let's turn our attention to the other side of the world to see what came out of the Western arcade divisions. Let's first check out two quick games from Stern called Anteater and Lost Tomb. Anteater was not a commercial hit, but its simple variation on the dot gobbler genre made it rough for clones, Sierra's Oil's Well being the most well known one. And Lost Tomb was an adventure shooter mashup where you explore a pyramid, raid the treasure and move on to the next level. It was a great mixture of shooter action and adventure elements that again inspired inspired many home computer knockoffs. And over to Williams who had two memorable releases. First one being Robotron 2084, the multi-directional shooter by Eugene Jarvis. You had to save the last remaining humans from a robot uprising by blasting them and racking up as much points as possible. It wasn't the first game to use a dual stick approach to gameplay, but it definitely popularized the twin stick shooter genre. The game definitely takes inspiration from Stern's Berserk game, but amplifies it by a million. It's another game like Eugene's previous game Stargate that was tough as hell, definitely made for the arcade veterans of the time. It turned out to be extremely popular and also spawned a kind of forgettable sequel called Blaster in 1983. Their other notable release for 82 was Joust. The game had a bizarrely unique setting that set it apart from all the other space shooters that had invaded the arcades at that time. Game designer John Newcomer came up with a strange idea because he didn't want to put out just another generic shooter. As he felt the arcades were just overrun with them at the time. I mean even Williams themselves had a massive hit with Defender. The game was a one or two player romp where you have these knights that ride on buzzards and you fly around on an ostrich and try to take them out. The jousting aspect is just like traditional jousting except the winner is determined by who hits the highest. Or you can just simply jump on their heads to defeat them. When defeated the knights turn into eggs which you can collect for bonus points but more importantly collecting them means they won't rehatch back into to more aggressive knots and therefore you have to defeat them once again. Just like most arcades you are also forced to complete waves of bad guys as quickly as possible or the dreaded pterodactyl will attack. Going too close to the lava also at the bottom of the screen can also mean certain death as a deadly hand will try to grab you and pull you down. The game is all about seeing how long you can last or how many waves you can survive with each one increasing in speed and the amount of knots and obstacles that are thrown at you. It's classic early 80s arcade gaming. I was absolutely terrible at this game in the arcades as a kid. I never fully knew how to play it properly. It was only much later through video game compilations that I got to play this again and actually figure out how to play it properly and learn to enjoy it. There was also an arcade sequel in 1986 which was more of the same but if you enjoyed the original version then this is well worth a play as well. 
Now let's look at Midway, who in this year merged their pinball division, Bally, into one division, now called Bally Midway. One of the first games from this was Tron, based on the summer release sci-fi movie by Disney. The game did a fantastic job of capturing the sights and sounds of the movie, and was just like the film where you had to start off the game on the grid, choosing your level. It featured four different zones, all based on action sequences from the movie. It was really well received, and reportedly brought in 30 million in revenue by 1983. One of the mini games that was left out of the game due to time constraints of getting it out close to the movie's release was the Tron Disc sequence. It ended up becoming released as a separate game in 1983 as Discs of Tron. Next from Bally Midway was Satan's Hollow, a game that freaked me out as a kid when I first saw it in an arcade and I absolutely refused to play it. It was a fixed screen shooter where you had to build a bridge to reach Satan and take him out, as well as his endless hordes of attacking gargoyle minions. Besides shooting, you also had a limited shield which could absorb fire and fry close flying gargoyles. I eventually ended up playing this game on my C64 which had the only port as I found it on a bootleg disc. It's great and is a fantastic fixed screen game well worth trying in both its versions. And finally was Miss Pac-Man, published and designed by Bally Midway, not Namco themselves. Midway had the North American distribution rights and made the game almost completely independent of Namco, although Namco did sign off on the game in the end and collect a lot of the royalties. For me the arcade Miss Pac-Man is Pac-Man. It was the first version of it I ever played and honestly to this day I still think it's the best of the 80s classic era Pac-Man games. Everything from the original just improved upon. I mean it's not night and day difference or anything but enough to make this game way more desirable. Music and sound is improved, the intermission screens actually tell a story of Miss Pac-Man and Pac-Man himself, and I think the ghost AI were a lot more unpredictable, with each of them having much more of their own personalities. It was always a must play every time I saw it at a local cafe. The game ended up becoming one of the most successful US released arcade games of all time, and with the character being female, like its predecessor, it brought in even more female gamers out and drove to burn their hard earned quarters just like all the boys. And over at Atari we got two new color vector graphics entries. Gravatar was a variation on the gravity genre, taking elements of Atari's own Lunar Lander and asteroids and mashing them together. You have to steal fuel and blast turrets on various planets before moving on to the next one, getting more and more difficult and elaborate each time. Its convoluted control scheme made it another game that only arcade veterans could appreciate, but it is still quite an excellent game in my opinion. It also spawned many clones, most notably Thrust, released by Firebird in 1986 on all 8-bit microcomputers at the time. Atari's other game was Space Duel, which is essentially an updated version of asteroids, with full color vector graphics this time and a pretty good multiplayer mode as well. 1981's Asteroids Deluxe wasn't the hit that Atari had hoped for, so this was another shot at the formula. It's actually a very cool game well worth playing, but sadly was quickly forgotten with the glut of machines coming out at the time. And the final game for this year was Qbert by Gottlieb, who were more known for their pinball games and video games. This was their biggest video hit. It's an asymmetric puzzle action game where you have to turn all the blocks on a level a certain color while avoiding the bad guys. It's a very simplistic game that was easy to pick up and play by anyone, and appealed like Pac-Man and Frogger to a really diverse audience. The game's popularity made the Cubert character become a new merchandising machine resulting in mass profits for Gottlieb, and he even got his own cartoon in 1983. Gottlieb also released a successful pinball version of the game, which actually wasn't that uncommon back then to get a complimentary pin version, and this ended up becoming Japan's second biggest pinball hit of 1983. And with that, the insanity of 1982 was over, bringing an end to one of the most lucrative in terms of profits and creativity the arcade industry ever saw. Thousands of fantastic games were still on the way, so strap that seatbelt in and get ready for 1983. Shall we play a game? Oh, <laughs> let's play Global Thermonuclear War. Fine. <laughs> All right. 1983 saw the North American video game crash. We go by what we call what's in the cash box. You know, the cash, like I was mentioning, the cash box is a cruel mistress. And that's what we go by. Which was a result of an oversaturation of software, both subpar and literally making way too many games, more than there were consoles sold, resulting in millions of unsold games sitting on shelves. There were also too many new consoles on the market and many companies formed just to make a quick buck, resulted in a completely saturated market. Video game 
Williams fever has prompted a number of businesses to try to cash in on that billion dollar craze. Book publishers and even movie producers are trying to make video games pay off for them. And ended in a sense the US console market dominance. But it is true that too much of a good thing can be hazardous to your health. Most countries outside of North America were not affected by this. In particular Japan who stepped up and released three new systems. The Famicom by Nintendo, the SG-1000 by Sega and the MSX computer which was a hybrid console as well. Outside of Japan though the Famicom in its NES incarnation would be the only major international success, but it again paved the way for the Japanese dominance of video games in general, from consoles to the arcades. Electronics is changing so rapidly, and with each change in electronics it brings something new. So this is not a passing fad. The US crash did however also give rise to the home computer dominance by Commodore and Apple, bringing completely new gaming experiences to popularity like strategy and RPG games. But just like the other systems at the time, arcade conversions were still a massive selling point. Out of all the sectors of video games though, arcades weathered the storm being least affected. But will this popularity last is the question. Well the makers of video games are gambling that it will. Largely due to the arcades at this this point being bombarded with Japanese games and with Japan going through an economic boom at the time, the arcades were the place to be for cutting edge gaming. It's a very tough dollar and it's getting tougher, it's not easy, we all want that same buck. So let's first have a look at the western arcade scene this time around and we'll start off with Atari who as the intro suggested, who is partly responsible at least their console division under Warner Brothers for the entire video game crash, which in itself is a video on its own. But this is about arcades so let's look at that division, which was for the most part at least going by output and game quality, unaffected by the rest of the mess happening in the industry. Cloak and Dagger was first up, a game tie in with the 1984 movie of the same name, which I absolutely loved as a kid. The game itself is a fast paced Robotron style affair with multi-directional blasting action in its 33 levels as you blast and blow up each level making your way down to get those stolen plans and take out the boss. In the movie the Atari 5200 cartridge version is where the spas have hidden their stolen data. The game is also seen played on a 5200 in the movie although it's actually the arcade version because the 5200 version was cancelled so it doesn't really exist. This movie as well as War Games, Tron and The Last Starfighter all use video games as an element in their plots to really great effect, using them without exploiting them. That's something Hollywood has completely forgotten. I guess The Wizard is to blame for that. Next was a game that wasn't that well received, but it still should be noted for what it managed to accomplish. That was iRobot, another David Thera game and the first arcade game to feature real time 3D polygon graphics for gameplay. In the game you play a robot who rebels against Big Brother and goes on a rampage to bring him down in this big bold multi-directional shooter. Another unique feature is you actually had control to switch camera angles a first time in a video game. The game overall though was a massive flop for Atari and only between 700 and 1000 machines were ever made. Its combination of clunky controls, which to be fair 3D games still suffer with to this day, and maybe being a little bit ahead of its time, ended its arcade run pretty quickly but memorably. Next was Crystal Castles, a much loved asymmetric game, which was all the rage back then. The game however was a basic maze dot gobbler. You had to collect all the gems in a level while either avoiding or jumping over enemies. The game featured 10 levels with 4 sections in each except the last one, and is noted for being the first arcade game with an actual ending. Its trackball control scheme though makes most ports of this feel really odd to play, but still interesting to check out. And finally from Atari was their best game and their most successful game of the year and another example of a quality movie tie-in game with Star Wars, the arcade game. The most eagerly awaited arcade game of the year, the brand new Star Wars. 
Sound familiar? Let's check out the action. It puts you in the shoes and seat of Luke Skywalker piloting an X-Wing as you take out the Death Star. The game reenacts the final action sequences from the movie. It employs fast, full-color vector graphics that Atari had perfected by this time. And with the game's abundance of speech samples and that awesome John Williams music, it was truly an arcade experience to be remembered. There are three parts to the game, the TIE Fighter Assault, the surface of the Death Star, and the final trench run where you deliver the killer blow to the star. After that, the game repeats only harder, but does add new gameplay elements. It was available in both sit-down and upright cabs. I was lucky enough as a kid to play this many times in the sit-down version, and the combination of graphics and sound made it an absolute joy of an experience, and is still fun to play to this day. This machine was supposed to be ready for the summer opening of Return of the Jedi, but just now is arriving. And arriving from Williams himself was Sinistar, a game designed by John Newcomer of Just fame, as well as one of the programmers being R.J. Michael, co-creator of the Amiga and the Atari Lynx. The game was another in a long line of fast-paced, multi-directional space shooters that was definitely for veteran gamers, just like Defender or Stargate. You have to blast asteroids and collect crystals, which you need a bunch to make up a Cinnabomb needed to destroy the Dementor boss Sinistar himself and the complimentary digitized speech by Sinistar used to really creep me out in the arcades as a kid. It takes a while to get to grips with this game but once you're in the zone Sinistar will have you coming back for more and more. And now let's flip over to Bally Midway and first from them was Spa Hunter, a top-down vehicle type combat game that started life out as a James Bond arcade but due to Bally's inability to secure the Bond license they changed it ever so slightly to Spa Hunter. You basically travel the roads blasting and ramming spas to their death. You can also take different paths and even transform your car into a boat. It's a damn lot of fun but a really difficult arcade game with nice detailed graphics and that addictive Peter Gunn theme tune that gets stuck in your head. It was followed by a much less successful sequel in 1987. More from Bally was Tapper, also known as Root Beer Tapper in certain parts of the world. The premise of the game is you're a bartender serving drinks to thirsty customers. The faster you do it, the quicker they'll leave and you can move on to a new bar, which there are four of in total. There's also a can shuffle minigame between each. It's another fun, addictive game that played like nothing else at the time. The lovely high-res graphics and great sound and personality of the game really won you over immediately. The Tapper version with all its alcoholic adverts was used in real bars, but later the Root Beer Tapper family-friendly version was released mass market for everyone to play. And lastly from Bally Midway was Journey, a trashy collection of bad minigames where you play members of the 80s rock band Journey as they travel across the galaxy trying to get back their music instruments so they can put on a concert. It's pretty weak, but it's yeah because it's the first arcade game to use digitized graphics for characters, which were all photographed headshots of the band slapped onto cartoon bodies. The game is trashy, but at least it does have a pretty good rendition of Don't Stop Believing, so you got that I guess. And the final US release we'll look at yeah was Dragon's Lair, released by Cinematronics, who are better known for their vector graphics games. The game was the first Laserdisc arcade game released in North America, not the first one ever made though. As Sega has that honor, which we'll be looking at shortly. It is, however, the first employing full cartoon quality cell animation, and absolutely blew your mind the first time you saw this at a local arcade. The game was created by Don Bluth, a former animator at Disney, and the game involves you as Dirk the Daring, a knight on a quest to save Princess Daphne from the clutches of a dragon. The game's visuals and sound are movie quality, but it only gives you the illusion of controlling a character, as gameplay is made up of simply pushing the right direction or action at a particular time. Later games would employ this gameplay mechanic as mini-games or transitions between scenes where they came to be known as quick time events. Dragon's Lair is basically one massive quick time event. Even though the gameplay is pretty basic, it's still a joy to play and was followed by a Laserdisc sequel in 1991 called Time Warp and many completely different sequels for home formats. That traveling caravan style of the Tivoli's or the state fairs or whatever you would call them. I don't know if there's any equal thing over in North America or in South Africa, but it would basically be a caravan that would go from town to town, stay for a week, and would be like roller coasters and whatnot, and the arcades would come at that time. So growing up in South Africa as a kid, it was kind of a melting pot when it came to arcade gaming. I think what makes Australia unique is that we had a company here called Leisure and Ally. I think this was pretty special because it just kind of brought with it excitement and every time, uh, I think it was twice a year that this happened and there would be new games. And they made their own cabinets 
I don't think there was, there was ever a time, or it was very rare, that we would actually import arcade machines in the 80s and early 90s. There wasn't like any official kind of distributor that you got the arcade games from. It was uh, basically a free for all. It was like the wild west of arcade gaming. And it would be games um, from around the entire world uh, because um, they travel through Europe. We got stuff from Europe, we got stuff from America. We got stuff from Japan, we got stuff from everywhere. Lizard and Ally used to make their own cabs for specific games, like for example for the Outrun, sit down cabs, Our, ours were just different to overseas. And uh, I've heard from some sources that did work on like setup and stuff that uh, a lot of these games were picked up in Germany and France and they directly imported from Japan. Half of it was uh, licensed games, like real stuff. Some, a lot of it was like just complete bootlegs. There were cabinets, they were, had full artwork that looked absolutely wonderful. There was cabinets, they were just bare bones, but had games. I think that's that's what makes it different for us, for the rest of the world, is that we, we made our own, and they're really sturdy cabinets, and they're really great. So I do remember playing a lot of Japanese arcade PCBs. Uh, which is kind of special. We were kind of lucky in that sense here in Scandinavia that we kind of had this access, uh, which I do know that over in um, the US, not so much. It was an absolute melting pot of everything. We also got a lot of Japanese games. I did notice that because I was a big fan of um, kind of games that were from other countries as a kid. I don't know why, what drew me to that. I think it was the idea of you know, playing something that nobody else had played. They weren't like cheap knockoffs. They actually did try to make things look really good. Like, for example, I personally think that our Neo Geo cabs are the best looking cabs in the world, uh, especially compared to the to the US versions. I just, I really dislike them. I just think the Aussie ones just look, just look nice. So they look more polished. Now let's flip on over to some of my favorite 1983 Japanese releases and we'll start off with Elevator Action by Taito. My earliest memory is when probably I was about four years old, there was a fish and chip shop next to my house and while ordering chips they had a arcade machine, they had um, Elevator Action which I really enjoyed as a kid and uh, yeah I was about four or five yeah but I had no idea what I was doing but I picked it up and that game still has a you know special place in my heart, I really enjoy it. The game was a platform styled action game where you played as an agent infiltrating an enemy building with the objective of stealing some secret documents and then escaping. The game had 30 levels or floors to go through, each getting a bit more chaotic with every turn. You make your way down elevators looking for a red door which is your target and where the secret documents are, all the while shooting and avoiding the stooges in black trying to kill you. You have a gun with unlimited ammo to blast them or light fixtures and send everything into to chaos. Once you acquire the document, you have to beeline it to the bottom of the level and escape by car before the next level starts. The gameplay seems simple, but it's very fluid and open to all kinds of awesome action, with ducking, jumping, and even getting crushed accidentally in those death trap elevators. The game's graphics are really good for a 1983 release, with sharp, well-defined animated characters and simple but very well thought out stages that set up the action extremely well. It's super satisfying, firing off a stream of bullets before jumping on an elevator as some poor schmuck bad guy opens the door and inhales a whole row of bullets. The music only has one main track that repeats for the whole game which is usually a pretty big issue but it's such a fun little simple tune that you'll be humming it long after you finish playing the game. The game eventually saw a sequel in 1994 called Elevator Action Returns which was absolutely brilliant and is far less well known than this original classic. And first up from Sega was the first Laserdisc game ever made and released commercially called Astron Belt. It came out in Japan in early 1983, a good many months before Dragon's Lair made its US debut. It was an on-rail shooter similar to Sega's Buck Rogers, only this time the backgrounds were full streaming FMV or full motion video, with your spaceship being a 2D sprite overlay to give the illusion of a movie-like experience. It was a typical shooter where you take out waves of enemies before each boss character but the sheer presentation, explosions, and the sound blew everyone's mind in 1983. It is, in a sense, responsible for kicking off the entire interactive movie style genre that will become very popular in the early 90s once CD-ROMs became common tools in computers and console expansions like the Sega CD slash Mega CD bringing these games to the forefront. It performed extremely well in all regions, causing Sega to release a sequel called Star Blazer. It was released by Bally Midway in the US where they changed the name to Galaxy 
Ranger, which is not to be confused with the Galaxy Rangers cartoon from 1986. Next was Congo Bongo, a game partly developed by Ikigami Sushinki, who also worked on Sega Zaxxon in 1982. The game also used an isometric viewpoint, just like Zaxxon. The story has you trying to capture an ape called Bongo over four different stages. Just like Donkey Kong, you have to avoid obstacles like giant coconuts being thrown at you, monkeys, and you even get to cross a river on the backs of a whole bunch of creatures, Frogger style. It's a real fun romp that plays and looks really great, and back in the 80s everybody referred to it as Donkey Kong in 3D. It was an immediate hit in Japan, but took quite a few years before becoming really popular in Western countries. The actual home ports to computers at the time actually shone a light on the game and made it more popular in the arcades. And lastly from Sega was Up and Down, an isometric style racing game, where you have to traverse these deadly mountain roads collecting all the flags while avoiding road hazards and other cars. You could take new paths at every intersection and either jump over or on top of other cars for extra points. It's a great enjoyable little game that I first played on my Commodore 64 and didn't even realize it was an arcade until running into it a couple years later. And lastly but most importantly from Sega was the setup of a new division within the company called Section 8. This was significant because it was headed up by Yu Suzuki and they'd later rename themselves AM2, and you'll be hearing a lot more from them soon. RM, Nanko, and Jellico all had fun little titles that I wasted way too much time on back then. RM Zippy Race, or Motor Race USA as it's known in North America, is a fantastic overhead race against the clock type game. As you attempt to traverse the USA on a motorbike city to city, picking up fuel and avoiding crashes. Out of all the games that were released this year, this was the one I probably played the most. Namco also released the annoying but highly addictive and highly difficult Mappy, a side-scrolling platform style game where you are Mappy a mouse cop trying to retrieve stolen goods from a bunch of cat gangsters. It's fast-paced and difficult but is very unique and well worth a try if you haven't. And lastly Jellico released Exerion, an absolute banger of a shoot 'em up that has been completely forgotten over time I feel. The game employs a fake 3D style landscape and your ship controls through inertia. You have to blast waves of enemies with your double guns and rapid although limited machine gun fire that me and my friends used to dub Death Blossom after the main spaceship's move in the movie The Last Starfighter. I actually play this all the time at a local cafe. It was wedged between Kung Fu Master and Rally X. I feel like this game was lost in the glut of US shooters that came out at the time, but it was a big hit in its native country of Japan, and it was the top grossing arcade for two months straight. Next was two classics from Konami. Let's first jump into Gyrus. The game is a pseudo 3D shoot 'em up that can be best described as a mashup of two 1981 arcades games, Galaga by Namco and Tempest by Atari. Gyrus itself was the brainchild of game designer and producer Yoshiki Okamoto, whose previous game before this was the excellent Time Pilot. But after the release of Gyrus, he left Konami for Capcom, and there he designed and produced countless classics such as 1942, Final Fight, Street Fighter 2, and many more, before resigning from Capcom in 2003 and forming his own company. The game's plot has you trying to make your way back to Earth. Every stage gets you one planet closer. The game plays like Galaga, with streams of bad guys flying in and taking position and formation as you blast away at them. The difference is you can move 360 degrees around the whole screen blasting them from all angles. The game employs a pretty good fake 3D look that works pretty well and was really impressive at the time. I was lucky enough to have this machine in my local cafe close to where I lived as a kid, right next to the commando cabinet, and subsequently played this a ton back then in its original form. Besides the aliens that you are blasting, there are also invincible asteroids to avoid, and also alien satellites that are attacking you, and if you kill them, you get the much needed weapons upgrade. Bonus stages kick in once you reach the next planet, which are really fun shooting galleries where dying is not possible. And if you've been wondering why I've been playing the classical music score Tokata and Fugu in D minor ba ba, well it's actually the game's soundtrack, which is a bizarre choice, but it works so well in this game, and used to have me humming this piece all the way home off to blow in all my quarters. This is a classic and simple arcade game that you should definitely try if you haven't already. And a completely different game from Konami was Track and Field, an Olympic style multi-event game that had been done before on home systems with Activision's Decathlon, but not in the arcade with at least a full set of events such as this. The six track and field events were the 100 meter dash, long jump, javelin, 100 meter hurdles, hammer throw, and high jump. The two button setup was also well done. Mash one to go as fast as you can running, and the other button activates the action. 
it was simplicity at its best. Its massive success kicked off multi-event sports games becoming a huge genre of gaming in the 80s, inspiring everything from Daily Thompson's Decathlon to the Epix game series. And we'll also be checking out 84's sequel, Hopper Sports, later as well. And our final game for 83 is from Nintendo, and they gave us the first proper Mario game, simply called Mario Brothers, that featured the red-wearing plumber himself, and his brother is here too, Luigi, if you play in the two-player mode. It's a single-screen styled action platformer where you have to clean up the sewers by murdering all the creatures down there that are taken over. You punch a block under where the enemy is, rendering them unconscious, giving you time to whack them off screen and collect some bonus coins. The longer you play, the more deadly the enemies get. It again was developed by Miyamoto and Yokoi. Uh, were there anybody else working at Nintendo at this time? But despite being released in the middle of the video game crash, it proved insanely popular in both the US and Japan, and saw a whole slew of home ports flood out the gates. Nintendo themselves also landed in hot water over their previous title Donkey Kong, with Universal Studios suing them, claiming they used the King Kong character in their game without license. Nintendo absolutely refused to pay them royalties, and it went straight to court. In a nutshell though, Universal's claims to the character weren't 100% true, and the judge ruled that the Kong character at this point fell into public domain category, which Universal already knew. The judge was not very impressed with their bully tactics against Nintendo. Nintendo then received almost two million in compensation. However, had the case gone the other way, that may have been the end of Nintendo outright. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. The world's number one selling home computer is now in a family pack, the Commodore 64. Plus data cassette and joystick, four software programs including Introduction to Basic, a teach yourself program for the whole family. The Commodore 64 family pack, a value of $700 for just $499. We die. With the video game crash leveling the home game playing field and the rise and dominance of computer gaming over consoles, those all-important arcade conversions became more and more lucrative to software companies. Almost any arcade game was getting licensed for home ports and the appeal of seeing your favorite cabinet played at home was undeniably appealing. Some of my best gaming memories from this period is playing arcades and their home conversions. And in some cases, the home versions were the only ones I ever played as the arcade industry continued to release games at a rapid pace. The arcades, at least from the mid 80s, before that not so much, but from the mid 80s onwards it felt like arcades were built around cooperative play. I always felt with the arcade you always got the better graphics for sure. I remember playing so many games of like Golden Axe and Final Fight and stuff like that where you really had to play together to win. The full body experience was one thing. The bigger controls, the bigger buttons and all that stuff. Home computers at the time and consoles were doing that all the time. The ability to kind of sit down in cabinets like the Outrun one, that's probably the biggest difference obviously. But you know, you didn't get to really play with your friends too much. But the arcades, you know, standing next to somebody, especially a stranger who you never knew, and they would just put in a coin and join you, and you kind of had to become friends really quickly. Because it was this immersion that you wouldn't get um, from anything at home. I mean, sure, they had two-player games, but I always felt that, because I grew up with the Intellivision as, as I, my family console, I played a lot of the two-player games with my friends, and you didn't get that experience with the with the arcade. Help each other through the game, especially when it came to boss fights and stuff like that. That was something that was kind of unique, because at home you're always playing with either your brother or your sister or whatever, your friends. Sure, your friend could stand behind you and watch you play Centipede or something, but it, at home we got to play games like boxing and um, you know, other sports titles that you couldn't really play too much of in the arcade. But in arcades, people would join who you never knew and it kind of gave this kind of like social aspect to gaming. The idea of transporting that full body experience home existed and would continue to happen. I mean, the activator and all this kind of nonsense and then light guns are another variation of that. Certain games that just weren't in the arcade like Snafu and 
uh, you know, just games that you get to play together. I used to love those games. 1984 was a big year as we saw the arcade debut of Capcom. Capcom was formed in 1979 and was a combination of a few companies set up by the founder, Kenzo Sujimoto. It eventually received the Capcom name in 1983. The name, if you didn't already know, is a shortened version of two words, Capsule Computers. Capcom, which the company came up with to describe the early arcade scene which they were a major player in. Arcades remained their primary format in the early days, but they eventually branched out into consoles. Their first arcade game, however, was called Vulgus and was a top-down scrolling shooter map. It wasn't really anything special on any level, but it did kickstart their games division. It was designed, however, by Takuro Fujiwara, who we saw earlier was one of Konami's top designers, and the music was by Oyakamori, who also did their next game for A4 called 1942. This one was designed by Konami Defector No. 2, Yoshiki Okimoto, and was an extremely popular and successful top-down shooter set in World War II during the Battle of Midway. The game was designed with a Western market in mind as Capcom realized the potential of appealing to a mass audience. It featured power-ups and tons of good blasting action, and ended up becoming their first major international hit. It was followed by 1987's extremely popular 1943, which we'll look at at later. And now let's look at Atari who after 1983's massive shakeups almost seemed to overnight change their style of arcade games from the vector centric to the more popular Japanese sprite style look probably due to two factors being the rise in popularity of import games and the fact that they had just designed a new arcade board called Atari System 1 which was capable of displaying impressive high res graphics and FM style stereo sound it would change the look of the Atari arcade division forever. The first game to use this board though was called Marble Madness. It was an asymmetric style maze race game where you had to guard your marble through a level avoiding death and crossing the finish line before the time ran out. This game is definitely best played in two player mode with double track balls which was Atari's focus and really makes that miniature golf type feel of the game extremely fun to play together. It turned out to be really successful selling almost 5000 cabinets and is cited as being one of the first arcade games to feature true stereo sound. Atari's second Star Wars game was also released, an adaptation of of 1983's Return of the Jedi, the last movie in the original trilogy and honestly the only Star Wars trilogy you should bother watching. The game was an asymmetric styled action game where you get to pilot three different vehicles from the final battle at the end of the movie. You get to use a speeder bike, the Millennium Falcon and an ATST Walker as you attempt to blow up Death Star number two. It's not as revolutionary as the original Star Wars game from one year earlier, but still quite enjoyable anyway. I used to play the Commodore 64 conversion all the time, as Return of the Jedi was my favorite of the classic movies. And the last game from Atari we're going to look at here is called Firefox, a laserdisc game based on the Clint Eastwood movie of the same name. So this is honestly not a great game at all, but it's just interesting to note how many big companies took a shot at laser a disc gaming back then. I never ever see any of these games mentioned in any arcade documentaries besides Dragon's Lair which gets bashed over your head, so I wanted to make sure this subgenre got a bit of attention in the early years. The game did the usual with FMV backgrounds and sprite overlay. It's definitely no Astron Belt, but it probably inspired one of my favorite Sega CD games called Tomcat Alex, so I'm definitely not complaining. And after 1983's disastrous year for Warner Brothers and Atari, where they lost 500 million dollars, they decided to sell the entire Atari home division to Jack Tramiel. Warners although decided to keep the arcade division as it was the only part that was still making money despite the crash. And now let's check out Namco's diverse selection of games and we'll start off with something that looks sort of familiar. The Pac-Man franchise took a major left turn with Pac-Land. The game was designed as a side-scrolling action affair and was made to coincide with the release of the Hanna-Barbera Pac-Man cartoon that was being released in the US at the time. Even the main theme music was based on the show. Even though the game's perspective had changed drastically, it's still kind of the same. Make it to the end of the level by dodging ghosts and other obstacles while picking up fruit for bonus points. The goal is to return a lost fairy to Fairyland and then make it home to the Pack family. It features tons of dodging and platform style action, with great colorful and fun graphics and a pretty infectious main tune. It was a big hit in the arcades in both Japan and North America. Toru Iwatani has said in interviews that it's his favorite Pac-Man spin-off game, in terms of concept and gameplay. He also said in an interview, it pioneered action video games in which the scene flows horizontally. According 
to its creator Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo's Super Mario Bros. was influenced by Pac-Land. Next is a double dose of titles that were clearly influenced by the computer RPG genres at the time, both East and West. The games in question are Dragon Buster and Tower of Druaga. Dragon Buster is an action adventure game where you have to save a princess from a dragon. That old chestnut. The game was very innovative, it introduced light RPG mechanics has multiple paths for the player today, introduced a health bar, and also gave us the double jump feature and definitely influenced the later games like the E series and Wonder Boy and Monster Land, and ended up appearing on many Japanese home computers of the time. As an arcade though, its popularity was mostly in its home country and is fairly obscure outside of Japan. The other title, Tower of Druaga, was much more of a maze dungeon basher, where you have to climb a 60 floor tower to rescue a maiden. That old chestnut, part 2. Namco was selling it as a fantasy Pac-Man and the game's maze elements, RPG style upgrades to your character and the almost endless dungeons of bad guys to dispatch made it feel like the best of a western RPG at the time like the Temple of Apshai for example. It was a massive hit in Japan and was the second highest earner of 1984 in their arcades. And lastly from Namco on a completely different note was Gapless, another game in the Galaxian series. It's a pretty forgotten game I feel, even though it's extremely fun to play. It honestly doesn't stray too far from the Gallagher form with the exception that you can fly all around the screen and not just left and right. And you can acquire the awesome tractor beam from Galaga and capture enemies and use them to boost your firepower. It was quickly forgotten though, but definitely worth checking out if you like the other games in the series. And now on to Nintendo, whose arcade division would actually be winding down, with only a couple more releases, at least in this decade, due to their focus on the Famicom in Japan. And no, I won't be covering the Nintendo vs series of arcades, simply because all the games are essentially slightly modded Famicom games and not true arcade games. However, their big arcade release for 84 was Punch-Out, an extremely successful series of boxing games. And with sports games not really being a big genre, at least in the arcades at this time, the game turned out to be a massive success and popular all over the world. The machine had a dual monitor setup, one for stats and the other for action, and is basically a giant dual screen game and watch. It delivered some extremely fun gameplay, excellent graphics, tons of digitized speech, and was followed up by Super Punch-Out at the end of the year, which is more of a DLC deal, in which there were new characters and moves, but still the same basic game. And now let's check out a couple of titles from Data East. First was Karate Champ, published by Data East, but actually developed by Technos. It was the blueprint for the entire versus beat-em-up genre. Attempts had been made before, like Sega's 1976 effort, Heavyweight Champ, and even a lot of home systems had tried them out. But all these games lacked any sort of depth. Karate Champ changed that. It was a karate tournament simulator where the best of three rounds wins. It was one hit ends a round approach, just like a real tournament. Later games in the genre though would introduce energy bars as the standard. The game employed a dual stick approach, which was admittedly pretty hard to get to grips with initially, and allowed you to pull off the 24 different moves. The original version of the game released in Japan was a single player only, but a revised version was released not long after that, which featured a second player versus mode. This is the version that got the international release. The game was a smash hit, Data East's biggest ever, selling over 30,000 cabs by the middle of 1985 alone in the US, never mind the rest of the world, and this game was the basis for a whole slew of games Technos had just around the corner. And Data East's other game was a shot at the Laserdisc market with Cobra Command, an anime inspired shoot 'em up interactive movie game where you have to fly a helicopter and have to take out an army of terrorists bent on world domination. It featured many levels from from New York to Easter Island, you were equipped with a machine gun and rockets, and also had to dodge certain terrain or situations. What's interesting is the designer of the game, Yoshihisa Kishimoto, would go on and make many classics for Technos. Amongst these, the Double Dragon series, which actually has an homage to this and his next game, Road Avenger. You can see the Cobra helicopter in Billy and Jimmy's garage at the beginning of Double Dragon 2, and the Road Avenger car in the garage at the beginning of the original Double Dragon, which is a cool Easter egg for arcade fans. And now we'll switch over to RM who had one of their biggest hits, a game distributed through Data East called 
Kung Fu Master or Spartan X in Japan. The game is loosely based on the Jackie Chan movie Wheels on Meals, one of my absolute favorite Chan movies. The film was called Spartan X in Japan, hence the arcade name. The game however is basically Bruce Lee's Game of Death, where you have to fight your way up five floors to rescue a girl named Sylvia, which is a character from the movie, as well as yourself, Thomas, named after Jackie's character. These are the only real links to the movie, plot wise anyway. The game is one of the first examples of a scrolling beat em up, with you having to take out hordes of bad guys before facing off against the local level boss. The combination of great graphics, excellent sound effects and that earworm music track made it an instant classic. The designer Takashi Nishiyama, who we saw earlier design Moon Patrol, was invited to join Capcom by the then president Kenzo Sujimoto, where he went on to make many games such as the original Street Fighter, before joining SNK and creating the Fatal Fury series. And RM's other game was Load Runner, which was part of a short-lived trend around this time of converting computer games into arcade games, which was pretty uncommon, but does highlight the immense popularity of computer games at this time. Load Runner was originally released by Broderbund in 1983 and appeared on many systems such as the Atari 8-bits and the C64, where I originally played it. Gameplay involves you trying to steal all the gold bars in a level while avoiding the guards. There were 150 levels in the home versions, but RM chose 24 of the best levels for the arcade. They upgraded the graphics and sound dramatically. Gameplay was almost exactly the same though. You could still dig holes for the guards to fall into, buying you time to finish off a level. But sometimes guards were hidden in places you dug, so you could unearth them and make your life a lot more difficult. If you like the computer versions, it's well worth checking out. And now on to Sega, who will look at two interesting entries. Bank Panic is first a unique take on the light gun style game, although there was no light gun. In the game you play a sheriff defending a bank from being robbed. You have to move along watching the doors and blasting robbers, but making sure you don't kill innocents depositing cash. Once all the cash registers are filled, it's off to the next level. The game is really great fun with a simple control scheme and large well animated graphics. It was always fun to see this at my local arcade. It also spawned a bunch of clone games as well, the best being West Bank released by Gremlin Graphics, which I played on my Commodore 64 and I actually thought it was an arcade conversion of this game. And over on the Laserdisc front, Sega gave us GP World, a Formula 1 styled racing game. It used the same basic techniques from Astron Belt by using an FMV POV shot of the entire racetrack with sprite car overlays. You could choose between three different tracks and it came in a massive sit down race cabinet. Again, gameplay was pretty simplistic, although it is similar to Sega's Turbo, and no more simplistic than any races at the time. It's another cool take on what Laserdisc could bring to gaming. And next was Konami with a whole heap of great titles. So let's start off with Maki, probably one of the most overlooked games out of this year's Konami selection. The premise is you play high schooler Maki who's trying to put together a letter from his girlfriend. In order to do that, you need to run around your high school while avoiding the teachers, jocks and everybody else and collect all the hearts. Each heart makes a letter and once a word is complete, you can escape the stage. There are five levels in total from a classroom, locker room, cafeteria, dance studio and a football field, all with their own enemies and authority figures to avoid. Gameplay is simple and addictive with risk reward tropes where you gotta keep trying to get those hearts no matter what, but also know when to back off and do some dodging. It's very fast paced and quite difficult and it was a real quarter muncher back in the day. One of the most unique aspects of the game though is the soundtrack which features two songs by the Beatles, which are A Hard Day's Night and Twist and Shout, even though that song was already a cover. I always thought these songs were unlicensed in the game, but they were actually licensed through Jazzrack, a copyright collection agency in Japan to be used in the arcade version. Imagine what hoops you would have to jump through these days to make that sort of deal happen. What's interesting is that the game that was made exists only in its original form in Europe and the USA, because Konami got cold feet in Japan about it with its story of a delinquent high schooler getting up to mischief, and decided to change the whole setting to an office salaryman environment, with the game going under the name Shinyu Shain Torukun, which means Freshman Employee Toru, and was released exclusively in Japan by Sega. Up next was another beat em up that took what Karate Champ did and ran with it. The game was Ya Kung Fu. My cousin introduced me to this game which was at his local grocery store. The weird thing was it was wedged between two other Konami games, Jailbreak and Iron Horse. How's that for a weird coincidence? But obviously the Kung Fu action sold me immediately. Whereas Karate Champ was a slow and more strategic game, Ya Kung Fu was super fast and very unrealistic. 
you could jump around the screen like a madman, forming all of the 16 different moves, which were pulled off without the need for a dual controller setup. In the game, you have to fight your way through 11 martial arts masters to become the Grand Master yourself. Besides the first and last opponents, however, everyone has some sort of weapon that you need to overcome. This is also the game that introduced an energy bar to this style of brawler. I love this so much in the arcade, I convinced my dad to buy me the Konami Coin-Op Hits compilation, just so I could play this on my C64, which was a brilliant version. The arcade became one of the top 5 earners in the US in 1985, and the home computer versions in the UK became the number one best selling game in 1986. We also got from Konami the sequel to track and field called Harper Sports, which featured another 7 new Olympic style events. You had swimming, skeet shooting, long horse, archery, triple jump, weightlifting and pole vault. I actually preferred this game to track and field and spent a lot of coins mastering it. It had the same simple button setup and easy to understand gameplay. The graphics and sound were much improved and the events overall for me anyway felt much more varied. This is also another game on that legendary Konami Coin Ops Hits compilation. I probably ended up playing the C64 version more than the arcade, but every time I did come across this game it got a coin immediately. And lastly from Konami was a Laserdisc release which before making this video I never knew they made or even had heard of this game. It was called Badlands and is a western themed game where you have to avenge your family's death by taking out a gang that killed them. Its gameplay just boils down to shooting at the right time and the timing has to be really perfect though and I found it pretty frustrating to play. It's ultimately pretty forgettable and Konami never attempted another Laserdisc game after this. And on to Cinematronics who had a sequel of sorts to Dragon's Lair called Space Ace. It was also developed by the Don Bluth Animation Studio and is a game in a similar style to Dragon's Lair only this time with a science fiction setting. The game did however bring a bunch of interesting additions to the gameplay like having multiple paths to choose from, a difficulty mode to select and there were sequences where you could choose to become your hero version of yourself or just your plain regular self which changed up all the scenes. The characters are all extremely likeable from Ace the eager young Buck Rogers hero to the demented Borf the alien bad guy and Kimberly who's is basically Daphne in space. It's a fun game where dying is part of the fun due to all the cool death animations and was another great Laserdisc release. And our final game for 84 was Bombjack by Tekken who would later change their name in 1986 to Tecmo and create some extremely popular franchises like the Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive series. The game itself though is a highly addictive platform action game where you have to defuse a bunch of bombs quickly around the screen all the while dodging enemies. It's basically simple fun and got many home ports including two different home version sequels and an arcade one in 1993 called Bomb Jack Twin. In 1985 saw the arcade's popularity get stronger and stronger due to a bunch of factors. It was true that the industry's profits were down from 12 billion at its peak in 1982 to just over 100 million in 1985. It was significantly less, but the arcade industry was still thriving. And with the introduction of Sega's Super Scalar games, 16 bit processors in many arcades, and massive hydraulic cabinets giving players something they couldn't get in home entertainment on computers or consoles. So let's start off with a Atari whose new System 1 arcade board went into overdrive plus their final Star Wars vector graphics release which was The Empire Strikes Back, their third Star Wars arcade game and a jump back to 83's Star Wars vector style as opposed to the raster look of Return of the Jedi. It is again an on rail shooter taking specific action scenes from the movie. You get to fly a snow speeder over Hoth blasting AT-80s and AT-ST walkers and the second set of levels puts you in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon blasting TIE fighters and avoiding asteroids. Just like Jedi, it's pretty good but not as memorable as the original release though. And over to something completely different with the release of Gauntlet, an excellent dungeon bashing hack and slash game with similar elements to Namco's Tower of Druaga. Except Gauntlet emphasizes faster playing gameplay and was all about that co-op play with its original four player cabinet release and also being released in a two player version later. It was another brilliantly addictive game from designer Ed Log, who we saw earlier with Asteroids and Sentinel 
centipede. You have to fight your way through level after level trying to find an exit as quickly as possible while collecting food to keep yourself alive. Each of the four playable characters had their own looks, strengths and weaknesses just like any RPG style game which Ed said Dungeons and Dragons were a major influence. It was a massive hit and being multiplayer meant it racked up profits way quicker than usual which led many companies to start designing their games with this function specifically in mind. Atari sold over 8,000 cabinets and it topped the arcades in both the US and Japan. Sequels followed in the arcades and home computers. He has an old photo of me and my brother in the 80s playing some gauntlet on my C64. It was a true multiplayer classic. And next was a game based on the second Indiana Jones movie. The Temple of Doom. I remember first playing this game at a really dodgy beachfront arcade in Durban, South Africa. The weird thing is I didn't actually see the game but heard it from across a few rows of arcade machines. I was jamming out to Green Beret when I heard the indie theme music and beelined it over there immediately. It was also the first one to have real speech samples and sample John Williams music from the movie. Atari themselves were already veterans of the Lucasfilm conversion process, having made the complete original Star Wars trilogy for arcades. Temple of Doom though was going to require a completely different style. The movie was a swashbuckling, seat of your pants roller coaster ride of action, which is actually where the initial idea for the game came from. Laserdisc arcades were all the rage at that time, and the team's first idea was to make it a Laserdisc game and focus solely on the minecart sequence from the movie. But they came to the conclusion it was just going to be way too expensive to film it. So they switched it over to the new Atari System 1 board. Peter Lipson, who worked on classics like Blasteroids and Ramparts, headed up the project. And he said, We had the script and we saw some of the film as it was in progress. It was obvious we needed to build the game around the whip. We wanted to include the minecarts too. And thus the game was born. Just like the movie, you have to rescue the captured kids who have been imprisoned in the mines by the thuggy cult and forced to look for the remaining Shankara stones. The game has four distinct levels, all set pieces from the third act of the movie. We got the rescue the kids sequence, the minecart chase, stealing the Shankara stones, and finally the showdown with Mularam on the rope bridge. Mularam, prepare to meet Kali in hell. The flow of the game is you repeat the first three levels three times. Then on the fourth go, the Shankara level is replaced with the rope bridge for the climactic ending. One of my favorite aspects is the choice at the beginning of the game's difficulty. Arcade games just generally didn't do this, as they wanted you to die as much as possible to pump in more credits. But not only was it a cool addition, but each level of difficulty just added more detail and aspects to the game, so it actually rewarded you for getting better. I thought this was a cool idea, especially for an arcade game. The game, just like the movie, is fast paced and you gotta keep moving or you'll die. Each level plays a bit differently which keeps the gameplay interesting. I always thought the graphics are really top notch and has that high res system 1 look that still looks very impressive, even now. And of course the sound which really made this stand out from other arcades at the time. With its abundance of speech samples and that pumping John William music just got you in the mood for adventure. And here's what Peter Lipson had to say about the end results. We were pretty happy with it. It might have been nice to include the plane crash as a skiing game for example but we had very tight constraints since the whole game had to fit on EEPROMs and they weren't cheap. I thought we captured the spirit of the movie quite well and I agree. Overall the game keeps that fast pace hanging on for your life feeling the third act of the movie is known for and they did a really good job with it and is a classic old arcade game that's well worth having a go at. And this was followed by another licensed game called Roadrunner. It's based on the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes characters, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. Meep, meep. The game played out exactly like the cartoons, where the coyote was always trying to catch and eat the roadrunner. But the roadrunner was just way too fast and always one step ahead of him, despite Wiley's use of every acne gadget in the book. which do make their appearance in the game. It was another one of those Atari arcade games at the time featuring those nice high res graphics and that same great sound and was quite fun to play. And Atari's final game of 1985 was my favorite of theirs which was Paperboy. Paperboy's gameplay was simple. 
Survivor Week, delivering papers to all the area subscribers and try not to die in these super deadly 80s neighborhoods. You have to survive for one week. With every missed delivery, they unsubscribe. Surviving a full week sends you on to the next difficulty level. If you survive each day, you also get a bonus BMX track race sequence. This game was what every good arcade game should be. A quarter muncher. You just had to try it again and again and again. The game ran on Atari System 2 board, which they had just released that year, and was able to produce a much higher resolution graphics back then, as seen in the other game, 720 Degrees, which also ran on that board. The game also featured tons of digital speech samples, something that was not so common back then. Although the Atari arcade games at the time, like Temple of Doom and Gauntlet, would be jam-packed with the stuff, grabbing your attention in the arcades completely from across the room. In 1986 saw the start of Paperboy's home computer and console ports. About 25 different ports of this game currently exist as of making this video. Eventually in 1991 the game received its official sequel on all home consoles at the time, skipping the arcades completely. Unfortunately it was met with mediocre reviews and is an often forgotten port of the Paperboy legacy. And now we'll be flipping over to Japan for the remainder of 85 as the Japanese arcade games were just dominating and steamrolling the western companies in both technology and game design. So first was Konami who kicked off one of their most successful franchises with Gradius or Nemesis depending on the country. It was a side-scrolling shoot 'em up with all the cliches you come to expect such as power-ups and waves of enemies both on land and sky. Except this game defined most of those cliches. It featured massive boss characters with each requiring precise firing to destroy. Your currently equipped weapon made a huge difference on how easy or hard this would be resulting in some sort of strategy strategy to keep in your mind as you played. Also having the choice to change to another weapon or upgrade your current one was very unique. It's a wonderful shooter that is very difficult but fair with excellent music and great graphics. It was another big hit all over the world with it being particularly popular in the UK becoming the biggest earner arcade by the end of 1986. Most of the sequels though saw home releases but we'll also be looking at 1987's Salamander Arcade later. And continuing on the shooter front we also got to see the start of the Twin B series considered by most one of the first cute em up games although as I stated earlier there were other examples that may have kicked off this style. It flips the shooter style to vertical and emphasizes two player action. Its gameplay style is similar to Exevious in that you have regular fire and bombs to destroy ground targets. Upgrades are obtained by collecting bells which you can blast before collecting them changing their upgrades from say speed to firepower and many more giving a frantic type of strategy to the gameplay. Two player mode also gives you the ability to join your ships together for some more mental action. The graphics are extremely cartoony and colorful with a happy-go-lucky soundtrack and you can't help but love this game despite its pretty hard difficulty. And jumping over to the racing genre with Konami GP which is honestly not the greatest game I've ever played but it always caught my attention with its first person road avenger look and I would always just have to give it a go. It's a simple race to the goal without running out of fuel type of game. Basically zippy race in a car. It was always an impressive game to look at and it was running on Konami's new GX400 arcade architecture and is worth having a look at at least through emulation. And finally probably their most iconic game of 85 was Green Beret or Russian Attack if you lived in the US. It was a side scrolling run and gun game even though the gun weapons were limited pickups. You were Green Beret trying to rescue POWs from various Russian locations. Your main weapon is a knife but limited pickups included a flamethrower, RPG and hand grenades and each level ended in some sort of crazy boss character or a massive of soldier onslaught. It was an insanely difficult game that required much patience to enjoy. I remember playing this for the first time in the arcade as my dad and my uncle and his wife watched. My uncle's then wife was horrified that I was just stabbing all these dudes to death and laughing while I was doing it. She was so appalled she left the arcade as my dad handed me another quarter. Oh the 80s. And now let's check out some Taito published games and the first is Tiger Heli, published by Taito and developed by Toplan. Japanese software company Toplan was formed in 1979 and had their headquarters in Shimizu, Tokyo, Japan. They are most well remembered for their massive contribution to the shoot 'em up genre in the arcades right up to their bankruptcy in 1994. Many of their games were published by other developers overseas but they actually made classics like Slapfight, Flying Shark, Truxton, 
Twin Cobra, and so much more. Tiger Heli was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up and Toplan's first game in this genre, and pretty much set themselves up for what they did best right up to their closure. The team at Toplan took inspiration from an arcade game called Jarodan, released a year earlier, and used that as the basis for Tiger Heli. The game set itself apart from the glut of shooters at the time by having a much slower, more relaxed pace, which the team wanted to make it more inviting for new gamers to try it out. Even though you are flying a helicopter, you only ever fought ground targets, which was kind of weird, like tanks, boats, gun emplacements. No planes or helicopters attacked you. As per standard, even in 1985, a smart bomb is included for desperate situations. But unlike other games, it also acts as a form of defense, meaning if you have bombs available and a bullet hits you, it automatically activates, saving your life, blowing everything up on screen, but you losing a bomb in the process. I think it's a pretty unique concept, and I'm assuming the team implemented as another way to keep gamers happy, so you'll come back later to play it without walking away in frustration. Little mini helicopters can also be joined to boost your firepower, and if you died on a level, there were certain checkpoints the game would automatically restart you at. I loved this when I first played it as a kid. The graphics were so extremely colorful and detailed, and I really loved the small little details, like shooting the houses and the little puffs of smoke come out as you flew past them. This game's arcade board was later used in another slower paced shooter Toplan developed called Slapfight, which is another great game in its own right. Two sequels were released later on named Twin Cobra in 1987 and Twin Cobra 2 in 1995, and are brilliant shoot 'em ups as well. If you're new to the genre or just not a fan of those bullet hell operas, then give Tiger Heli a go and see the origins of Toplan's shoot 'em up legacy. And next was a dive into Laserdisc with the release of Time Gal, another quick time interactive movie title. It saw your character Riker traveling through time, trying to catch up with a madman by the name of Luda, the dude that laughs every time you die in this game. <laughs> The animation is exceptionally good and was done by Toei Animation Studio, and the game scenarios are just plain crazy. Unfortunately, the game never saw a release outside of Japan due to the Laserdisc technology being very expensive at the time and the genre, at least in the West, having run its course. The first time I ever saw and played this game was on my Mega CD in the 90s and loved it, even though, as per usual, it was simply a large quick time event. This is also the second to last Laserdisc we'll be having a look at before its revival in the early 90s through. American laser games. And now let's look at three quick random games here, one called City Connection, Road Blaster and Tank 3. With City Connection, Jalico delivered a strangely fun and addictive platform action game where you have to drive your car and paint the entire level to escape. It featured all kinds of Japanese weirdness but is such a fun game to play. And SNK gave us Tank 3, also known simply as Tank. It was a vehicle running game game where you used SNK's rotary joystick controls that would be used later to grab effect in Akari Warriors. And the game also saw the debut of Ralph from that series. It's a pretty fun tank blast em up and a precursor to Akari Warriors that came out in 1986. And finally Data East gave us Road Blaster, one of my all time favorite Laserdisc games and another one with animation by Toei. It was a post apocalyptic car game where you had to take out a gang that had killed your wife. It's basically anime Mad Max. Just like Time Gal, unfortunately it only saw a Japanese arcade release but was later ported in the 90s to the Mega CD where again I played it and it had its name changed to Road Avenger in English as not to be confused with Atari's Road Blasters arcade from 1987 and overall it's just another fantastic game by Kishimoto. And now on to the heavy hitters for 85, Sega and Capcom. Sega had four very diverse games that we'll be looking at here. The first one is following on from the RM trend with another computer game to arcade conversion with Choplifter, another game by Broderbund released originally on the Apple II in 1982. In the game you fly a helicopter rescuing POWs and transporting them back to your base. You could bomb the ground to take out tanks and shoot jets with your machine guns. It was an absolute blast to play. This is another cabinet that got swapped out at my local cafe when I was a kid right by my school and I blew a lot of money on it. For me personally having played the C64 version to death, this Sega arcade version is the definitive 80s choplifter experience, at least in my opinion. Those 
wonderful detailed graphics and sound all running on Sega's new System 2 arcade board just makes this a must play arcade game. And on the other home game to arcade upgrade was Pitfall 2, originally released by Activision on the 2600 and was that system's last big selling game and arguably one of its best. The arcade game took elements from both the original game and this sequel and mashed them together for this new interpretation. It sports some lovely graphics and bouncy music and still retains the same gameplay although the game is definitely much harder and more frantic. If you do like the Pitfall game series it's an interesting side game that not a lot of people have played. And next was a big one. Hang on, Sega's first super scalar game using technology to the fullest in all respects. The latest arcade board, 16-bit graphics and a massive motion control bark to sit on. It truly was a sight to behold in the arcades. It was designed by Yu Suzuki, his second arcade game and it blew the racing game competition away completely. It was based on the GP500 motorbike racing which was extremely popular at the time worldwide and the game itself had you riding point to point against the clock and other riders simply to make it to the next checkpoint before the time runs out. A time on a trope that Suzuki would use for most of his racing games. Its music was also excellent by Hiroshi Kawaguchi who had become Sega's resident Mozart composing memorable and classic rock soundtracks for many of Suzuki's best games such as Space Harrier, Outrun and Afterburner. I was fortunate enough to play this as a kid in its full red motorbike edition and it played so well even though my legs could barely touch the ground for balance. Sega shipped 7,000 of the full deluxe versions of the game which cost around $7,000 each or $16,000 adjusting for inflation. It was a huge success both in Japan and worldwide and it was one of the top arcade earners for 6 months straight and became the second highest earner behind Nemesis in the UK for 1986. This was also the turning point for Sega and arcades and it put them in the unique position of making these massive motion simulation games that were not only popular, were not gimmicks but but also command all the arcade's best attributes into single machines. And to think Suzuki wasn't even done yet as we also got the second full motion Taikan machine called Space Harrier. Taikan was a Japanese term used to describe these full body experiences that only the arcades could provide. The game was Space Harrier, a fantasy sci-fi shoot em up using the super scalar arcade board for its 3D sprite action. You had to shoot your way through 18 stages of intense action with massive boss characters and awesome dragon riding bonus stages. It was a feast for the eyes and the imagination and with Kawaguchi's insanely infectious soundtrack it truly sucked you into its world completely. It like Hang On came in two different versions, the stand up cab and of course the ultra expensive full body motion controlled edition which I played many times at my local beachfront arcade. It was another worldwide hit praised for its fast gameplay, graphics and soundtrack. And now over to Capcom who really came into their own this year and became the classic arcade company that most of us know and love. Their first game was Gunsmoke, a vertically scrolling run and gun game set in a western theme with you being a bounty hunter tracking down the west's worst criminals. Unlike other games in the genre, the screen automatically scrolls up with you able to move around and shoot in three different directions, plus picking up upgrade items giving you more speed or upgraded weaponry. The game was extremely difficult with a one bullet and you're dead approach which definitely made it one for the veterans only to soak up and it was also another game by Yoshiki Okimoto and his counterpart Fujiwara had Commando, another addition to Capcom's run and gun legacy which puts you in the shoes of Super Joe, a one man killing machine attempting to rescue POWs and annihilate every scumbag he comes across with his machine gun and grenades. The action was fast and very difficult with a one bullet death as seen in Gunsmoke. As a kid I couldn't get anywhere in this game in the arcade, it just murdered me completely. The cool cartoon style graphics and thumping soundtrack made people come back for more and more. Japan and UK were its most successful countries with the home computer ports being even more successful than the arcade and I couldn't even count the amount of times I played the C64 version of mine. But Fujiwara wasn't content with just that and also designed and released Ghosts and Goblins which he was working on at the same time as Commando's development. This however was a side scrolling platform action game putting you in the role of Arthur a knight on a quest to save a princess captured by Satan. Good old 80s family entertainment.
entertainment at its best. You run along killing monsters while picking up new weapons, each better suited for certain situations. Unlike the sadistic commando and gunsmoke, you could take one hit losing your armor and the second killed you. Not that that made the game any easier by any means by the way. It was another popular game and I came across it all the time in the arcades and played it quite regularly. It also featured music from a Yakamori who did 84's Vulgus and 1942. It was another game that was a huge success not only in the arcades but on the home formats too and was the highest grossing arcade game in 1986 in Japan and one of the best selling computer games in the UK with the NES version selling 1.6 million cartridges worldwide. This double shot of hits from Fujiwara put Capcom right at the top of the club of the Japanese arcade manufacturers that would help rule the rest of the 80s arcade scene. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. If you have an influence over your youthful friend, you better exert it now. Otherwise, I will have both of you roll off to the hell where people are skinned alive. It's that simple, understand? Are you crazy? Is that your problem? With the launch of the Famicom in the West at the end of 85, now dubbed the NES. The latest video game craze to sweep the United States and Japan, it's called Nintendo. Console gaming was finally revived and with the help of Sega's new Master System release, the consoles were fighting back for that large par video game market. Unlike most documentaries will have you believe, the NES did not save the video game industry. In 1983, earnings for the industry peaked at $3 billion. Only two years later, Later, sales plummeted to a paltry 100 million. There was a lot of gaming going on throughout the world and it was doing just fine. In fact, the home computer and arcade scenes were flying along with massive sales and audiences. Both these industries were working almost in harmony as seen by 95% of these games we're going to look at yeah, got home computer and console ports. The arcades were still leading the way forward. For now. The NES did, however, revive the dead console scene. The difference between 1982 and 83 and 1985, 6, and 7 is technology has taken a substantial leap in our favor. I think the first game I played uh, in the arcade. It's difficult to pinpoint the exact moment when I first visited an arcade. I'm trying to think. This is uh, it's difficult. I'm getting old. But I feel like the game that perhaps made the strongest early impression on me was actually the original Outrun from Sega. It must have been Outrun, the original sit-down cabinet, uh, because I do have some kind of vague memory in the late 80s of sitting down with my big brother and uh, sitting in his lap and like turning that cabinet and it was really exciting and I really enjoyed it. I remember seeing those 3D graphics for the first time. I didn't understand how they worked or anything like that. But my earliest memory is probably Outrun, the sit-down cabinet. I just knew you were driving a bright red car across a real 3D track. At least that's what it looked like. So let's start off 86 by looking at a bunch of single game releases I want to highlight from some of the bigger companies. And let's start off with Capcom's racing destruction game, Speed Rumbler. The game is a mixture of driving with a bit of running gun action. The story is a bunch of Mad Max type bad guys kidnap everyone from a small village including the hero's wife and kids. And it's up to him to brave the fury road of the six stages to the zapper's base for some payback and rescue as many people along the way. I just love the graphics in this game. They're so small but very intricate and the overall the attention to detail is exceptional. The gameplay boils down to trying to speed your way through each stage as fast as possible while rescuing as many of the townsfolk as you can. As you rescue them they also provide much needed upgrades to your car like speed and stronger guns and also points and repair kits so it's vital you save as many people as possible to keep going. Of course you're getting constantly attacked by the Zappa gang who are trying to run you off the road, busy setting up massive roadblocks, 
cannons everywhere and all manner of death to derail your mission. The game is pretty tough, but like all good arcade games, with a little practice you can really master those levels. One of the best aspects of this game though is the ability to get out of your car and run and gun it on foot if needed. This simply blew me away as a kid, I just couldn't recall seeing any game before that do this. Essentially if your car is about to explode, you can bail out and hopefully survive long enough to jump into your replacement car. It's such an intense but fun concept, and I know this seems unremarkable now, but back then it was pretty amazing, and we still had to wait about 11 years before the original GTA did this concept any justice. The game was overseen by two of Capcom's most influential creators. This was just such a fun arcade experience at the time, and a bit of a forgotten Capcom gem I feel. And next, Daddy East gave us Express Raider, a side-scrolling platform beat-em-up. You get to play the bad guy this time trying to rob a train in the Old West, jumping between the cars, dodging signs and one-on-one -on -one brawls with the guards. It was pure Old West nostalgia, like playing out the best parts of a 70s spaghetti western. Nice graphics and sound round out this gem, which begs the question, why are there so few western themed games these days? And Bally Midway was next with the highly original multiplayer classic, Rampage. It was up to a three player flip screen action game where you get to play as one of three giant movie monsters, a werewolf, lizard and gorilla, all modeled after classic movie monsters. The goal of each level is to destroy all the buildings. You also have to contend with military attacks and eating civilians keeps your energy up. And you can even slap up your friends if you wish. It was a really unique game for the time and had wonderful high res graphics and lots of cool audio samples. Some great racing action was up next with Tatsumi's Buggy Boy, an off-road buggy action racer. The game featured five distinct tracks that were littered with obstacles as you race against the clock to reach each checkpoint. If you played this in the arcades originally it came in a massive triple screen cabinet. I remember actually seeing this at a mall once and there was a massive crowd of people around it waiting to play and I just never got a chance to play it but I did love the heck out of my C64 version. And on to Technos with their sci-fi classic named Zane Selina. It was a side scrolling run and gun platform science fiction affair with you playing the bounty hunter Zane out to rid five planets of their bad guy overlords. The first time I played this was at a cafe in South Africa called Parkside Supply Store which was just up the road from my school. After school on our way home on our BMXs we had always stop by this place and have a few quick games of whatever arcades they had pushed into the dark corners that week. Zane was one of the long line of gems I played there which also included Karnov, Atomic Runner and Choplifter. Zane drew me in big time. I really love the free Freedom you had to choose any planet you wanted to start with and just from an arcade point of view it was great because every time I played it you could try at another level and they were all drastically different in look and difficulty. You had a desert planet, jungle, water, rock and volcano planets to blast your way through. Zane was equipped with a nifty double jump and an array of weapons that could be picked off dead bad guys such as a grenades combo spread shot and massive laser fire. Your goal on each planet is you'll blast your way through the scum, some crazy mid bosses and then facing off against the end of the level bad guy. Once defeated you plant a bomb on their base and fly out of there as fast as possible which leads to the ultra cool shoot em up stages as you flee the planet. These sections are pretty easy but are a nice cool segue between the planets and gives a bit of variety to the gameplay which is always fun. The graphics are small but very detailed with a nice selection of enemies on all five planets. The gameplay is still pretty good but the key to survival is knowing what's coming up to either avoid or blast. Fortunately you have an energy system so you can take a few hits before you die which makes it far less annoying. The game suffers from the usual techno slowdown effect which is in many of the arcade games including the best known one Double Dragon but I honestly love it. I may be the only one which finds classic game slowdown to be charming as I always felt they were pushing the hardware to the limits to produce the game. Although it could also mean they were just lame programmers but I like to think the former. If this game looks familiar to you but the name seems weird you may know it as Solar Warrior as it's known in the US arcades or as Soldier of Light which here is my original Commodore 64 version and the name given to the European computer releases. Zane Selina was the Japanese arcade name. Having said that the Japanese version is still the best release in my opinion. 
as the US arcade version doesn't give you the option to choose the planets, which is a weird omission. Anyway, check this one out. It's a fun kind of forgotten techno gem that really doesn't get the respect it deserves. SNK were up next with an absolutely brilliant run and gunner called Ikari Warriors. It followed on from a trend of military based blasters invading the arcades at that time. Taito's front line was again cited as the inspiration, just like Capcom's Commando. Ikari was unique however, building off SNK's previous release Tank 3 by using the same rotary control and offering the all important simultaneous two player mode. Gameplay involves murdering everything with machine guns and grenades and also being able to jump into tanks to take advantage of those cannons and even running over dudes. <laughs> this game rocked. It was originally supposed to be a license game based on Rambo 2 the movie but SNK could not get the license secured in time for the US release and the game had already become really popular in Japan as Akari. It was a smash hit in the UK and Japan and became SNK's big breakthrough game in the US arcade market. And the last of the random stuff is two quick mentions of Chilla and Top Gunner, both by Exidy. Neither of these games are particularly great, but they are notable. Top Gunner was the last release vector graphics game in the arcade, and with Atari fully into their System 1 and 2 boards, it marked the end of this cool graphic style, at least commercially in the arcade centers. And the other title, Chilla, is notable as being one of the first exploitation or gore games. It was Exidy clearly trying to use their death race tactics from the late 70s to drum up press about their new controversial game which was a light gun based game where you had to murder people in torture chambers. You basically have to figure out how to kill them the quickest way before the time runs out. To say this game is in poor taste is an understatement. I remember playing it once in an arcade and was kind of creeped out by the whole thing to be perfectly honest. And if you lived in the US and never saw this game it's simply because Exidy's strategy failed and 90% of the arcades refused to buy the game so they had to sell the entire stock to less offended international countries, which explains why I saw it in my arcade in South Africa as a kid. Exidy would end up folding as a company in the late 1980s. And now on to a couple of Namco releases. The Return of Ishtar is a sequel to 1984's Tower of Druaga and continues where that game ended, with you having to now make it down the 128 floor tower to escape. This game builds on Druaga by adding in more light RPG elements, puzzles and foster gauntlet style gameplay, and a two player mode although the game can only be played with two people and a password feature was available so you could continue where you left off giving this game a real computer RPG vibe. The other game was Rolling Thunder which is clearly the inspirational basis for Sega's Shinobi. It was a run and gun style platform game where you are a secret agent who has to rescue your female partner from a bunch of terrorists. That old chestnut part 12. There were a total of 10 stages in total and you had to shoot your way through bad guys going in the doors to collect more ammo and weapons weapons, jumping high and low as you made it through the levels. It featured really cool graphics and tight gameplay was its key to success. It was extremely popular in Japan but had its biggest success in Europe and it was followed by two sequels, part 2 in the arcades and part 3 exclusively for the Sega Genesis. Now let's check out a couple of Atari releases starting with 720 Degrees, a skateboarding action sports game running on Atari's System 2 board and sporting those same lovely high res visuals as Paperboy. You get to skate around a neighborhood and pull up all tricks for points which gets you tickets to enter the four different skate parks such as a half pipe or downhill and many more. Do well on these courses and you can earn some money which you can use to buy new skateboard equipment to boost your performance like making your board go faster or making the jumps go higher. The original arcade cabinet had this massive ghetto blaster on top of it to crank out the tune and those dodgy Atari speech samples and was a real sight to hold back then. Atari's other cool game was called Super Sprint, a top-down F1 racing game. This game definitely helped define all the best elements of a single screen racer. The original arcade version allowed for up to three players to race at once. The tracks were also littered with shortcuts and hazards like oil slicks and even tornadoes and you can collect tools which can be used at the end of a race to upgrade your car. It was an absolute blast to play especially with two other people and again sported those lovely high res system 2 visuals. A sequel was also released later in the year titled Championship Sprint, which is basically the exact same game but with just a whole new selection of tracks to choose from. The game is also seen as an updated version of Sprint 4, an Atari arcade game from 1977. Tecmo had a couple of games that I also played quite a lot as well. The first was Rygar, a side-scrolling action platformer where you play Rygar, a dead warrior who's been resurrected to take out the big bad that now rules the land. The game features a ton of action and light 
platforming. Your disc weapon can be swung all over the screen for high and low attacks and features quick short levels that don't overstay their welcome, as well as small well-defined animated graphics and great music and sound effects. I really enjoyed this a lot in the arcades and played it a ton and translated those skills to my C64 version. A lot of money was wasted on this one. And the other techno title was Solomon's Key, an action puzzle game featuring 64 levels where you have to find a key in all the stages to open a door to escape. You can both make blocks or break certain ones which leads to the puzzle element as you're trying to make your path to the goal. You also have to dodge enemies and can pick up upgrades for your character. It was really unique and fun and feels like a bit of a mashup of Bubble Bobble and Load Runner and also received some pretty good home ports at the time. And now on over to the big boys, Konami, Sega and Taito who delivered an avalanche of great titles, all advancing popular genres with great tweaks and technical advances. First from Konami was Jailbreak, a side-scrolling running gun game where you play Joe, a one-man 80s cop taking out a whole prison worth of escaped convicts who have taken the warden hostage. Shoot criminals and avoid blowing away civilians which is way harder than it sounds and I played this game again at that grocery store which I used to play Ya Kung Fu. This game is brutally hard like most Konami titles of this era and requires a ton of patience and even more money to master. And I swear that dude on the arcade flyer is karate legend Sonny Chiba, don't you think? Jackal was next, a top-down vehicle shooter where you drive a jeep equipped with a machine gun and grenades as you drove through the battlefield blowing up buildings and freeing and rescue all the POWs and then dropping them off at airfields to be lifted out by helicopter. It's kind of like Choplifter but from a different perspective. Again this game has an optional two-player simultaneous mode and it was an absolute joy to play with good graphics and sound, although controlling the jeep did take a little bit of getting used to. The game also went under the title Top Gunner in the US arcades but is known as Jackal everywhere else. And next was a leap into racing with Weck Le Mans, a really well made and you guessed it difficult racing game based on the real life 24 hours Le Mans competition. It was fast, hard and had excellent sprite scaling graphics and pumping sound. It was a slightly more realistic version of OutRun. I remember playing the massive sit down rotating cabinet version of this and dying very very quickly but damn was it an amazing experience. It was really well received both critically and commercially but for whatever reason this game seems to be completely forgotten by most. And lastly was Konami's best for 86 with Salamander, a horizontal and vertically scrolling space shoot 'em up that was the next installment in the Gradius or Nemesis series. It featured six stages that flip between perspectives and the power-ups came fast and furious which makes it a much more fun game to play over Nemesis. It also adds a two-player option with some of the biggest and most impressive boss characters at the time and a rocking soundtrack. It definitely pushed the genre forward in style and slick gameplay that didn't punish the player like most Konami titles. Its biggest success was in Japan and was renamed Life Force for its North American arcade release and is just a fantastic shoot 'em up overall to play. And now over to Taito who had a stellar selection of classics starting with Arkanoid, a block breaking breakout kind of game that took the basic concept and ran with it. Until I played Arkanoid I always found the genre to be a little bit mindless, I kind of found them a bit boring but this turned the tables big time and changed my opinion completely. You have to destroy all the blocks to advance through all 33 levels but in this one you can also gain all kinds of power ups along the way just like a shoot 'em up and having enemies that also appear in the level which just adds to the chaos. It was a highly addictive game and still something I come back to and play all the time. Its blue metallic neon design was inspired by the movie Tron and the fantastic soundtrack was by Taito's in-house band Zun Tata. Its development time was extremely short and the game much to Taito's surprise ended up being a massive unexpected hit in all three regions across the world and remained in the top 10 arcade earners until late 1987 worldwide. And next from Taito was two games developed by outside sources namely Technos and Toplan but distributed by Taito in most countries. First was Slap Fight, a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up developed by Toplan. The game builds on their Tiger Heli game by keeping much slower pace but adding huge power ups and a sci-fi setting. I love how as you gain upgrades your ship just gets bigger and bigger in size meaning you may have more firepower but you are now a much bigger target for the enemies to shoot at. It has your standard pickups and bosses to deal with but the much more relaxed pace makes it really 
really fun to play through, but it's still no cakewalk. Apparently it didn't receive a huge run of arcade boards, making it a little difficult to find in most places, although I saw this game pretty often, but I just have to assume that most of those were bootleg versions, which is more than likely. It did prove to be pretty popular and would serve as the basis for other Toplan and arcade gems like Truxton and Grindstormer. And Technos's entry for Taito was called Renegade and was the start of their Kunio Kun series of beat em ups, which includes River City Ransom and Super Dodgeball. All of these games include the same character, Kunio, who was a Japanese high schooler who had a penchant for getting into brawls with everyone and everything. And that character was named after Technos's president at the time, Kunio Taki. In the game, a scrolling, almost arena style beat em up, you have to take out four different punk gangs and rescue your girlfriend who had been, yep, taken hostage. That old chestnut number 52. The game visually was also changed for western arcades, giving the game a much more of a warrior's movie makeover than the Japanese setting. The combat itself was way beyond what had come before, with punches, jumps, kicks and throws all adding to its cool style. It was a game developed by Techno's genius Kishimoto, who we saw earlier with Road Blaster and Cobra Command. Renegade would form the basis for his next masterpiece, Double Dragon. And Taito's final game for 86 is probably their most well known game besides Space Invaders. It was called Bubble Bobble, a platform action game where you play as either Bub or Bob, two humans that have been transformed into dragons, and you have to defeat 100 levels to face off against the boss so you can transform back into humans, and of course save your girlfriends who have been taken hostage. That old chestnut number 96. The gameplay was simple, shoot balloons at enemies and then pop them for the kill, move on to the next level. Of course power ups, bonuses and many variations of enemies appear to spice things up, and the co-op two player mode really makes this game shine and is its best feature. The game, like Pac-Man, was specifically designed to bring in a female audience with the cute characters and the use of bubbles as weapons. It did work and many couples were seen playing this game co-op style. It was also released at the same time as Arkanoid, and Taito didn't have high hopes for either game, but both of them turned out to be a massive success to their surprise. It did well in Japan and the US where it stayed in the number one arcade position for three months straight in 1987. It was followed by a sequel, Rainbow Island which we'll also look at in 87. And this game helped spawn a whole wave of cute platform ROMs, one of which is 1990's Snow Brothers, which is a personal favorite of mine. And finally, over to Sega, who had a massive, impressive output. First up is Quartet, which is an excellent run and gun styled multiplayer platformer that you could have up to four players play together. The actual arcade machine for this thing was a real beast, massive like Gauntlet. You were part of a military team who had to take back a bunch of bases taken over by an army of robots. You jump around shooting everything and then would have to defeat the local level robot who had the key that allowed you to progress to the next level. The more people you play with the more chaotic and better this game got. I used to play it many times with strangers and it was an absolute blast of fun. The game was designed by Raiko Kodama who joined Sega in 1984 as an artist. She would later be the lead artist and character designer on heavy hitters like the original Fantasy Star and was lead developer on the absolutely sublime Dreamcast RPG Scars of Arcadia which is still one of my favorite games on that system. The game turned out to be really popular on initial release but I feel just like Wet Glamour it's just been almost completely forgotten these days, which is a real shame. Next was Wonder Boy, a side-scrolling platform game that introduced us to the character Wonder Boy himself, a caveman kid whose girlfriend, you guessed it, has been taken hostage by the Dark King and only you can rescue her. That old chestnut number 173. There are seven main areas to make it through and it's literally a mad rush to get through each level as Wonder Boy's health is always draining so eating all the fruit inside keeps death at bay. You're equipped with axes and can pick up all manner of items such as a skateboard to help you through the levels quicker. I always enjoyed playing this back then. The wonderful cartoony graphics and that infectious title tune and the pure frantic nature of the gameplay was just fantastic. It also spawned a bunch of sequels both in the arcade and home entries and we'll be having a look at a few of the arcade entries a little bit later. The next game was Sega's answer to Williams's Defender. Just a thousand times cuter. It was Fantasy Zone. An extremely addictive cute-em-up that gave 
gave us the classic Sega character called Opa Opa, who is a sentient spaceship that defends planets from alien invasions. Gaming's second greatest story thread. There are eight massive levels in total, with you blasting all the alien bases in a level before taking out the giant boss character. Bad guys also drop money which you can use to buy upgrades at the local shop at any point in the level. This is just a brilliantly fun shooter with vibrant colorful graphics and cute tunes that sink deep into your head and never leave. It was a massive success in the Japanese arcades, staying at the top of the earning charts for two months straight in 1986 and helped boost the popularity of Sega's System 16 arcade board. The sequel was released on the Sega Master System as Fantasy Zone 2 The Tears of Opa Opa and strangely also got an arcade port the following year. And now on to Sega's two big Super Scalar Tycoon classics. First was Enduro Racer with the same team on board with Suzuki as designer and Kawaguchi on music and you knew it was going to be another gem. Enduro was a dirt bike off-road racing game that infused the best elements of Hang On and threw it into this out of control ramp centric racer that pushed the racing genre further ahead yet again. There were seven stages in total with tracks containing massive hills and dips, debris on the road and huge jumps that you could perform by pulling back on the handlebars, sending you flying into the air and shaving seconds off the clock counter. I remember playing this many times in its full bike mode and it was like being on your own personal roller coaster. It was as much fun to watch someone play as it was to play itself. The graphics were fast, the music by Kawaguchi was pumping and again it delivered all the thrills that only the arcades could give you. The full body motion experience. And now onto the one you've probably all been waiting for. Outrun. So I posed this favorite arcade game question to everybody and they all had a lot of trouble coming up with an answer and I never gave any thought to how I was going to answer it until I started recording this and it's really difficult to say what my favorite arcade game is of all time. There are so many. What's my fan favorite game? But when it all comes down to it, you have to choose one. Uh, Sega Outrun, which I've got here. Really lucky and always always lucky to, to have the game that I always loved as a kid. I would have to say Outrun, the full cabinet version. I never thought I'd have one as a, as, a, as a kid. I remember playing that with my dad for the first time probably not long after that game was released, probably 86 or 87 or something like that. The C64 version was the first version I had. As a game, it was just something else. It had obviously that audio tape with it, which was a lot, uh, which was the best, probably the best thing about it, to be fair. The full motion. My favorite game of all time, I'll never sell this one. The driving. And it's signed by Yu Suzuki, which is pretty cool. The graphics, the music. I'll probably get buried in it, uh, which kind of ends the video on a bit, bit of a morbid uh, morbid scene there. Everything just came together. It was like a culmination of, you know, technology pushing it forward and it just blew my mind. It was just an amazing game. It still is an amazing game. It was one of the most influential racers of the 80s and at the time becoming its own style of racer with many new unique elements. It was another masterpiece by the team of Suzuki and Kawaguchi whose styles seemed to meld together for gaming perfection. The game itself only took 10 months to put together from start to finish. In the game you race against a clock on roads, not a track, and you simply have to make it to the next checkpoint on time to extend your play. Suzuki wanted to make a racer that celebrated the experience of driving and enjoying it rather than versing opponents. Some of its unique features include the branching paths at the end of each segment which you choose giving the game a more open world driving experience and also the choice to choose whatever music you wanted to listen to from the radio which were three different Kawaguchi tracks. Suzuki himself is reported to have done most of the game's actual programming as he didn't get to choose the team to help work on Outrun as Sega was knee-deep in dozens of arcade and Mark III productions at the time. It was released in both a full-scale Tycoon version, which was the one I played the most, and the regular stand-up version. By 1987, Sega had sold 20,000 units worldwide, earning the company just over 240 million adjusting for inflation. This basically gave Suzuki permission to make whatever he wanted at Sega from then on. It was a huge success worldwide and stayed in the top 10 money earners in Japan all the way until 1990. It ended up spawning two arcade spin-offs, Turbo and Outrunners, and the true sequel came in 2003 with Outrun 2, hands down the greatest arcade racer ever made, at least in my opinion. The game's combination of fantastic high-speed graphics, full motion arcade experience, and the greatest arcade soundtrack ever, again in my opinion, make it a must-play game for anyone that loves the classic arcade experience. Can't you read? Mom can't.
says you have to let me in the club or else it's prescription. That's discrimination, jerkoid. Prescriptions, drugs, which are on if you think you're getting up here. The arcades continued to flourish as gaming was becoming more and more mainstream. I could have done that for longer. Just I lost all my ships. There was an avalanche of great titles this year as the games industry overall was regaining its momentum. And there were also a bunch of particular titles that defined their genres and set those rules in stone for everyone else to copy, or at least attempt to copy. So coming from the UK, what was unique perhaps about the UK? Arcades were literally everywhere. I don't recall anything that would have been unique. And I mean everywhere, you could go to the cinemas, there would be arcades. Uh -oh. Unfortunately, I think the arcades died off much faster here than any other part in the world. I'm sure this is the same in the rest of the world, but maybe not. So I've got a machine here next to me, uh, Donkey Kong uh, Jr. It's an official Nintendo cab. There were arcades in like local cafes. There were arcades in fast food restaurants. There were arcades in hotels. I've mentioned this before in my Player One memory series. There would have been some issues um, with some games not being allowed over here, maybe because of being too racy or having some kind of violence in there. Uh, I never saw any of these in the UK. Holiday inns used to always have an arcade section or rec rooms with arcades. I had to kind of start traveling to France and uh, the US and Japan. Uh, later in life to experience the game centers proper. UK always had uh, bootleg machines when it came to these kind of things, or there'd be in a cocktail uh, tabletop uh, video game. You couldn't get away from them. Beachfronts would always have an arcade. Every beachfront had an arcade. I remember this one down the south coast of South Africa is in a little town called Margate. Because I know that uh, in this country, uh, we tend to do, we tend to censor a little bit more than some of the other countries in the world. I never really remember seeing any official Nintendo cabs. That was just the excitement of a traveling arcade that would come to town. A lot of bootleg games like Crazy Kong uh, and things like that were the things that we played. It had this super cool arcade right on the beach again. You could just walk off straight into the arcade and uh, I remember playing like Jungle Hunt and uh, Battle Zone and Phoenix for the first time with my dad. Yeah, so bootlegs were quite common. Uh, generic cabs were kind of the thing. As far as uh, anything unique in South Africa, I think it was pretty, um, just the fact that arcades were everywhere. It's like the Coca-Cola trucks, just uh, much healthier for you. So let's start off with the Konami entries and a game called Ajax. It also goes under the name Typhoon. It was a scrolling shoot 'em up a genre Konami were excelling at at the time. But with a difference, you were switching to either a helicopter or a jet for different stages. The vertically scrolling sections were with a helicopter featuring a similar weapons upgrade system to Nemesis. And the jet sequence were 3D style on rail shooter sections using tons of sprite scaling and big bosses to destroy. The game was admittedly pretty tough, just like all Konami arcade games of that era, but its combination of great graphics and multiple shoot 'em up styles always made it a treat to play. Next was the much loved classic Contra, a side and third person style running gun game where up to two people can play at once, being either Bill or Lance as they set out on the seven stages shooting up a terrorist army that is held up on an island infested by an alien entity. That old chestnut. Just like Ajax, it flips its perspective on the shooting gameplay. From run and gun to behind the character style stages and massive boss fights, tons of weapons could be picked up as you lay waste to the island base one section at a time. Unlike the home version though, the arcade isn't anywhere near as difficult, making it probably the most accessible version to play. This was another game that my cousin showed me at some dodgy smoke filled pool hall, which we were way too young to be in at the time. Pool tables in the middle and arcades around all the sides. I loved it a lot and got the C64 version not long after playing it. Its combination of great graphics and cool soundtrack and its alternating gameplay modes made it stand out from most running gunners of the time. It was followed by a direct arcade sequel called Super Contra in 1988. It was another huge success for them, topping the arcade charts being in the top 5 money earners in 1987 in Japan, England and the US. And the last Konami game I want to look at for this year was Combat School, as it's known in Japan and 
in Europe or Boot Camp in the US. The game was a variation on Konami's popular track and field style arcade games, except this one put you in the role of a rookie army recruit, trying to survive basic training to become a US Marine. It was an extremely cool idea like no other arcade at the time. There were 7 events in total covering obstacle courses, shooting ranges, an Iron Man course, and you even had to fight the instructor in the end in a one on one versus style mode. And to top everything off, if you survived all that and graduated, you got sent on a rescue mission to save the US president from terrorists. Gaming's third favorite 80s plot, where the game flips into a kung fu master scrolling beat em up. Another brilliant Konami multi event sports game with big detailed sprite work, excellent speech samples, and some really good tunes. It's a great game that also received a lot of quality arcade conversions to the home micros of the time. There's a lot of us who remember pinball machines like these and pool tables like these, people my age and a little bit older. I spent a lot of time during the summer playing a pinball machine like this. And I remember the one thing about pinball machines is the score. You could always get it up to about 99,999 before it rotated back to zero. Now with electronic games, you can go to a million or two million or nine million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. And now let's check out Atari and three very unique and diverse titles. First up was Road Blasters, a racing destruction game where you have to shoot your way through a multitude of futuristic courses, each more deadly than the last, and reach the checkpoint before your fuel runs out. It was a pretty simplistic game running off Atari's System 1 arcade board. As you traverse the track, you can also blast other cars, turrets, avoid the mines, and you also got ships that dropped off special weapons for you with limited but powerful use and strength. It sports really nice high res graphics graphics and easy to pick up and play gameplay which made it ripe for arcade success. And a completely different style of driving game was next called APB, All Points Bulletin. A game where you take the role of a rookie cop that has to drive around the city issuing tickets to speeders and other offences. As the levels progress the jobs get more and more dangerous and soon you'll be after criminals with warrants. There is a lot going on in this game which does make it pretty confusing when you initially try to play it. On top of having to meet the daily quota of issuing tickets etc etc you can also also use money you pick up to upgrade your car with like a radar, guns, armor and a lot of other things. The best aspect of the game though is its really good sense of humor with funny cutscenes between levels and just the fun nature of the game. This was a System 2 release with one of the lead programmers being David Thura from Missile Command. The game apparently had a really long development cycle which led the team to constantly add new features which again makes it a bit complicated to play at first. But stick with it because there's a unique game in there that's never quite being replicated. And lastly from Atari was another first of its type game called the Zybots, a third person maze shoot 'em up, something that hadn't really been done in arcades before. The game was headed up again by Ed Logg who actually wanted it to be the third gauntlet game but Atari decided against the idea and it became its own brand and switched to a sci-fi setting where you and a friend had to destroy a bunch of robots set on destroying mankind. I'm not gonna say anything. I remember playing this game for the first time and thinking it was absolutely amazing. The top of the screen was filled with maps and stats and the bottom was used for the action. Go through the maze as quickly as possible blasting bots, picking up cash which again you can use as shops for upgrades for your character and obviously go against massive bosses. If you overlook the impressive 3D style graphics for the time the gameplay is a bit of berserk and gauntlet mashed together which is only a good thing. The game unfortunately did not perform well in the arcades which Ed chalked up to the slightly convoluted or ahead of its time control scheme. Whatever the case it's another forward thinking effort excellent Atari entry that definitely deserves some of your playtime. And now let's go over to Data East and first up is Karnov, a side-scrolling platform romp with you taking the role of Karnov, the fire-breathing Russian strongman on a quest to find the ultimate treasure. There were 9 levels in total and if you managed to see more than a handful then you truly were a skilled player or very rich. <laughs> this game is extremely difficult much like Ghosts and Goblins and I was honestly terrible at this game as a kid. It features a really cool cool variety of bad guys. My favorites being the skeletons riding the ostriches. I mean that's just demented. You basically shoot your way through a level picking up orbs which upgrade your abilities. You can also find items like ladders for example which you can throw down anywhere and allow you to access bonus areas or items. And each level ends with a brutally tough boss battle. Karnov was also a bit of a mascot for Data East at the time with him appearing in multiple other games most notably as a boss character in the first level of Dragon Ninja. 
and Karnov's Revenge, to name but a few. And Heavy Barrel was next, a continuation of the military running gunner genre that ruled the 80s arcades. This one takes all the elements of Akari Warriors and ramps it up to 11, with bigger, bolder and more intense action. A bunch of terrorists have taken over a nuclear bunker, so you get sent in to take care of business. It features the same rotary style control scheme as Akari, plus a two player option. You can pick up new weapons and keys which give you access to pieces of a gun called the Heavy Barrel, which is your ultimate weapon to acquire. It's a pretty cool memorable shoot fest with lovely graphics and big chunky sound effects and if you like this genre you'll love it. And the last one from Data East is the real Ghostbusters based on the cartoon series of the same name, which was also based on the movie. I don't think I ever missed an episode of this show and it's still my all time favourite cartoon series. The game however is a very loose adaptation of it, simply being that it was actually a Japanese arcade game called Maiku Hunter G that had assets changed to be used as a Ghostbusters game once Data East acquired the license. So in that sense it's Ghostbuster themed but has little to do with the cartoon or movie. None of this really is a bad thing though as far as arcade games go it's pretty fun top down run and gun adventure. Zap ghosts to automatically capture them and fight level bosses and deposit all the ghosts you zapped into the ecto containment unit. Then it's off to the next level which there are 10 in total. It overall is a pretty fun arcade game especially in the two player mode and it also received a bunch of home ports to the microcomputers of the day. I played my C64 one quite a lot and it was a pretty decent adaptation. The arcade was however pretty obscure and it only received a really small cabinet run. And on to the Namco front where they returned to a familiar character. 1987 was the year of Pac-Mania, the asymmetric gem by Toru Iwatani. Although it doesn't look like it, it's a return to the simplicity of the original with a few little tweaks. As you can see from the awesome graphics, it now has an asymmetric viewpoint which gives the game the illusion, at least in 1987, of 3D. It works really well. Junior Pac-Man's scrolling stage effect is here making the levels pretty big and sprawling but not to the point of tedium. Another gameplay addition is being able to jump which is pretty useful in evading ghosts and imminent death. The music and sound effects are at their best, really making this a brilliant variation on the original Pac-Man with just enough differences to make it stand on its own. And flipping over to a different genre now was Namco's Dragon Spirit, a vertically scrolling shooter where you get to control a dragon as you lay waste to nine levels of bad guys in your attempt, you guessed it, to rescue a princess from a demon king. That old you know what. Graphically and music wise it's a real treat with each level being very different visually from the last and some really great tunes as well. Gameplay is pretty similar though to Namco's own Exevious, with you having regular shots for flying enemies and bombs for ground targets. The power ups are also pretty cool with boosting your firepower to even giving you an extra head, King Ghidorah style. The game was followed by a sequel on the NES called New Legend, but the true arcade sequel came in 1990 in the form of Dragon Saber. And staying on the shooter bandwagon for two more games, we got Tecmo's Gemini Wing, another vertically scrolling blast fest that has you in a spaceship terminating an alien invasion on your planet. The graphics are a real treat with the alien designs and multi layered scrolling. It really pushed the look of a shooter in a memorable direction, as was the music by Metal Yuki, a Japanese game composer who went on to brilliant soundtracks in Thundercross 2 and Castlevania Rondo of Blood, just to name a few. This game was amongst one of his first games he did. It's a great blast fest with wonderful graphics, music, and solid gameplay. And probably the most popular 2D style shooters for 87 was no doubt RM's R Top, a game that became very influential for shooters in general for years to come. It ran on RM's 16 bit M72 arcade board and used all that power to deliver a shooter of pure graphical greatness and a rocking memorable soundtrack. In the game, you control the R9 ship on a one man mission to destroy the Baido, a dodgy alien race that wants to wipe out mankind, yada yada yada, that old chestnut. Your ship was equipped with an unlimited charge shot for tough situations as well as the ability to get a drone which could be attached to either the front or the back of your ship depending on your situation. And the drone is also invincible so it can be used as a shield and blast it off where it will randomly target enemies and take them out. Of course all other upgrades and different types of fires were available as well, as well as some of the biggest and most memorable boss battles the arcades had ever seen up until that point. Each level was a feast for the eyes, with its HR Giga style mix of biological and mechanical all mixed together. It truly was a classic. The arcade was a massive success, being cited as the number one moneymaker in Japan in 1987.
97 and 6 overall for 1988. This game is often cited as being way too hard, but in my opinion it's nowhere near as difficult as of almost any Konami game of this era and is completely accessible to enjoy. It was followed by R-Type 2 in 1989, which we'll look at later, and many home spin-off versions. And the last random game here before we go over to the heavy hitters was Guerrilla War, another top-down running gun military shooter by SNK. It was two-player, it had rotary control, big bowl graphic, and allowed you like Akari to jump into tanks. Basically it ticked all the military boxes for the time, and was another fun, if a bit generic, even by 1987 standards game. The original Japanese version of the game was called Guevara, after Che Guevara, and the second player character was Fidel Castro. <laughs> it goes without saying that they decided to change that for Western audiences. The game overall was a moderate success in the arcades, but became way more popular as a home game, which there were many versions of. And the first of the big companies was Taito, continuing their blitz of all the arcade halls. Their first entry is Rastan, this game is also known as Rastan Saga, a side-scrolling fantasy hack and slash adventure where you're on a quest to slay a dragon. The game has six levels, each split into three parts each. It was a big fun adventure game. Gameplay involved lots of hacking with your sword, platforming and climbing. Different weapons and items could also be found to upgrade Rastan's abilities. It featured big bold graphics and a really catchy score and was very successful upon original release. The Japanese version however is the only one to feature the full story cutscenes. They were all removed for the English versions for whatever reason. It was also followed by two sequels. Neither of them though were anywhere near as popular as this original version. And onto a game in a completely different style which was Operation Wolf. Back then making that weekend pilgrimage to the big city to play the latest arcade games was like a ritual that just couldn't be broken. I played this gem in an arcade in Durban, South Africa in a mall called The Workshop, a converted train station turned into a hipster style retail outlet. The place had an amazing selection of games up on the second level, wall to wall classics, Robocop, Outrun, Enduro Racer, the list is endless. Every time I went there they had at least a dozen new games. It was arcade heaven. As soon as I spotted Operation Wolf for the first time I beelined it for it immediately. It was a thing of teenage boys dreams, a massive Uzi submachine gun strapped on top of an arcade which let you live out your military hero dreams of mowing down thousands of bad guys all the while rescuing hostages and becoming the hero you always wanted to be. Operation Wolf. The best part for me was that this machine was still regular price and wasn't pimped out for double quarters to play, so obviously this was going to get some serious playtime. The game was the answer to virtually all the movies of the day like Rambo 2, Commando and Delta Force being the most obvious inspirations among others. Just like all the best arcade games, gameplay was as simple as it got. Go rescue a bunch of hostages kill everybody that gets in your way. This is without a doubt in my mind the best light gun style game ever made. It's just got a simple addictiveness combining the excellent metal feel of the gun, the massive detailed graphics and some of the best sound effects in a game just to make it as addictive as hell. There were six stages in total to blast your way through, everything from the jungles to a weapons depot, airports etc etc. Each one adding new enemies to the mix for you to massacre. The levels play out a bit differently than most games requiring you to blast a set number of enemies before the stage ends, which actually gives you a chance to strategize a bit, knowing when to spray bullets, use rockets, or start making much more concentrated shots to save your ammo. Civilians are also running all over the place, so try to avoid them, as well as bonus items to discover, and the amount of hostages saved will determine if you get the good or bad ending. Splendid! You are a real pro! Which wasn't a very common thing, especially in arcade games. It was also as much fun to watch as it was to play, and the feel of that Uzi has never been replicated quite as well, besides the T2 arcade game, which had a similar feel and look. The game was followed by three sequels, each one becoming a little bit less interesting for me, although I did enjoy Operation Thunderbolt, the direct sequel, a lot, and that one is also well worth playing. With the gun aspect obviously missing, I found that the best way to experience this game now is through MAME. The controller is obviously no substitute for the real gun but it still honestly plays really well and is a fun way to experience this classic if you never have. Its overall combination of detailed graphics, excellent chunky sound effects and that oozy controller make this an arcade gem I will never forget.
And next was the sequel to Bubble Bubble, which was called Rainbow Islands, taking place after the ending of the previous game, hence you playing as Bub and Bob in their human forms. It was another action platform romp, although it played quite differently from its original version. You now have the ability to shoot rainbows, which can be used as weapons against enemies, as well as platforms to climb your way up to the exit. You're also on a timer and the screen slowly starts to flood, take too long and you'll drown. There were 10 massive islands to conquer, with each having multiple levels. Despite Rainbow's bubbly music and really great graphics, I never found it as engaging as the original. It's certainly a fun game and well made though. It was released at the end of 1987 in Japan and ended up being in the top 10 arcade earners for 1988 overall in its native country. And flipping genres again, we got Taito's Continental Circus, a Formula 1 racing game much in the same mold as Namco's Pole Position. The game came in both upright and sit-down models with 3D glasses to enhance the gaming experience. Unfortunately, this was a game I never actually saw in any of my local arcades, so I never got to experience the full 3D effect and only played some of the home ports. In the game, you have to qualify on eight different races to progress. There was a much more realistic to your car with it taking damage, tires needing to be changed, which you'll have to pull into the pits for, and weather effects like rain also affecting the race making it much more than a simple point-to-point -point racer. The graphics are really fantastic and the music again is pumping by Zuntata, making it a racer well worth checking out. As an arcade though, it ended up selling more units than even Operation Wolf, although in retrospect it definitely didn't have that game's lasting appeal. And now onto Taito's triple threat of arcade shooter classics. First we got Darius, a side-scrolling shoot-em-up with a bizarre mechanical ocean vibe, with each of its many bosses being a mechanized fish-type creature. They designed it in that way to make Darius stand out from the crowd, and it definitely worked. In the game, you have to defend the planet Darius from a full-on invasion. Besides the game's unique look, the original arcade featured a three-screen setup similar to Buggy Boy to give you a very cinematic feel. The game was mostly standard at this point with power-ups and upgrades, but its unique setting, beautiful soundtrack, a game complements of Zuntata, and the excellent branching paths, which you chose after completing a stage, and there were 28 in total, but you could only experience seven levels in one playthrough giving the game's replay value a massive boost. There was another game that landed in Japan's top 10 earners for 87, making Taito another truckload of cash. And the other two shooters came courtesy of Toplan, the combo of Twin Cobra and Flying Shark. We'll look at both of these at once as they are both very similar in style. Twin Cobra was the sequel to Tiger Heli, with you in the pilot seat of a chopper again, and Flying Shark, also known as Scar Shark, was the start of a new series with you piloting a barplane. Both games featured full-on military themes and boss and included upgrades as well as massive screen destroying smart bombs. The memorable soundtracks to both were by Masahiro Yuge who ended up forming Tatsujin in the 90s after the demise of Toplan and continued on their shoot 'em up legacy. Both were released in 87 with Flying Shark ultimately outperforming Twin Cobra financially but both being very popular and I remember seeing these games in multiple arcades back in the day. Both games also received sequels with Twin Cobra 2 in 1995 and Fire Shark in 1989. 87 was the year for Capcom. It really felt like they hit their mark here, with consistent great quality and that distinctive Capcom look and style. So let's jump into the sequel of their 1984 hit, which was 1943 The Battle of Midway, the next installment in the series. Okamoto was back with another 16 stages of intense shooter action. Everything was improved with a screen killing lightning attack, the dodge roll from 42 back, and the best part is that there was no more one hit kills. You have a fuel bar this time that acts as an energy bar and an actual fuel bar which needs filling from dropped items. The more fuel you have, the more shots you can take before it's game over. The power-ups had all been amplified, giving the game a much more intense and over-the-top feel. The graphics and sound had also been improved dramatically, giving the game that distinctive Capcom arcade look, which would continue on for many years to come. It's what a good sequel should be, more of what you love with improvements to the main game. And the Okamoto train keeps on going with his next game, Black Tiger a fantasy platform hack and slash. This game always reminded me of Rastan, except it was way fast and emphasizes exploration and looting. I didn't come across this game very often, but when I did it was always a treat. Your quest is to rid the land of three dragons 
that have descended on it, bringing chaos to the world. The game's best feature is its 8-way scrolling action, meaning you could go anywhere you wanted to to explore the massive 8 levels. There were tons of items and coins to collect which you could use to upgrade your character's weapons, as well as your vitality which increases the further you go into the game. The graphics and sound are just excellent with tons of attention to detail, and the fast-paced, well-implemented gameplay make it just so much fun to play. Tamayo Kawamoto also did the soundtrack to this one, and it's another wonderful job. She would actually end up leaving Capcom at the end of 1988 after the Gauls and Ghosts soundtrack and joined Taito, where she became part of their legendary house band Zuntata. Overall though, this is just a wonderful arcade adventure game. Capcom's other design king was up next with Fujiwara's Bionic Commander, a platform run and gun adventure romp, featuring you as a lone commander infiltrating an enemy base to stop them from launching a bunch of missiles. You're fortunately equipped with a really handy grappling hook that helps you swing around and navigate the 8-way scrolling screen. The battlefield was also littered with power-ups to boost your gun's firepower as you take out hordes of bad guys and enemy boss vehicles. The US arcade version of the game was actually altered to make it seem like a sequel to the game Commando, with the main character also named Super Joe. But the Japanese and international versions don't have any of this, so it's not considered a true sequel to Commando. The graphics overall are great, colorful and cartoony, and extremely well animated. The hook mechanic works perfectly and is easy to use. The music is awesome with some really catchy tunes courtesy of Harumi Fujita, who would also go on to do the soundtrack to Final Fight and Strata the following year for Capcom. And the final Capcom gem here is Street Fighter. And I say gem in the sense of what it set up for the genre, not in the end resulting game, which is mediocrity at best. It is however a huge jump forward for the versus genre, and the start of one of Capcom's most well known franchises still to this day next to Resident Evil. The game was designed by Takashi Nishiyama, who we saw earlier deliver classics for Irem like Moon Patrol and Kung Fu Master. It was a one on one versus game with you only able to choose Ryu in a battle royale against 10 opponents from across the world to see who's the world's best martial artist. The final boss in this game is also Sagat, and this is where Ryu gives him the scar across his chest which is present in the rest of the series. I actually played this game a bunch of times in the arcade, and I'm talking about the big button gimmick version <laughs> which didn't add anything to gameplay, trust me, and those buttons were not as soft as they look. Playing the regular 6 button version though is way better. The big innovations to the genre however was the 6 button layout, which consisted of a light, medium and heavy attacks for both punches and kicks, which are still used as standards for most versus games to this day, and the use of the half circle movements, which in this case throws a fireball, and these kinds of movements became just a part of versus fighting games even up to this day. It's admittedly not a great game, and plays really stiff and doesn't flow well. The graphics are good, the music and sound is also pretty decent, but it was an important title nonetheless and would eventually get one of the best sequels to any game released in the early 90s, but more on that later. Unlike Nintendo, Sega seemed to have no issue juggling their massive arcade division and still support their new home console, and if you look at the lineup of both in 1987, you have to wonder, how did they do it? It's impressive. So let's first check out Shinobi, a game running on Sega's System 16 arcade board. It was a side-scrolling action game that, like I said earlier, owes a lot to Namco's Rolling Thunder, but still manages to be its own unique thing. You take the role of Musashi, a master ninja who has to destroy a group of terrorists that have taken members of your clan hostage. You traverse each stage, taking out the scum with either close quarters attacks, shurikens, or even use your ninja magic, which kills everything on screen. You have to rescue all the clan members in each stage before moving on to the next. Boss characters also appear on every third or fourth part of each level, then it's off to the next area stage. There are also the really cool first person bonus stages where you have to lob shurikens at hordes of ninjas. If you manage to survive that till the end, you earn an extra magic attack for the next level. The game received a direct arcade sequel in 1989 in the form of Shadow Dancer, and in the same year saw the release of Revenge of Shinobi on the Mega Drive, a launch title for the system. I played this game all the time in the arcade. I used to see it everywhere and became really good at it and could get pretty far in one quarter. There's also a lot of really great home versions as well, and I used to practice this game on my C64 before heading out to the arcades, and it was a great version as well. And remember, slapping a ninja on anything in the 80s instantly made it cool. Next up was Alien Syndrome, a sci-fi top-down run and gunner, and another very successful arcade at the time. This one was also running on the System 16 hardware. The game let you choose either two characters 
Ricky or Mary as you explore alien halves, rescuing civilians and taking out giant boss characters. There was a host of upgrades to your weapons that could be found, with everything from grenade launchers to flamethrowers, and the game consisted of seven massively diverse looking stages. Playing this game co-op in the arcades was always the most fun, and it really felt like you were playing out the final act from Aliens, as Ripley was trying to find Newt and rescue her as the timer was running out. I'm sure it was more than an inspiration for this game. It sports wonderful, detailed and colourful graphics, making all the levels look vastly different from each other, and that pulsy, atmospheric music was the icing on the cake. And another game I absolutely loved was Wonder Boy in Monsterland, an action platformer with light RPG elements. That was the sequel to 86's Wonder Boy, although gameplay wise they were completely different. My favourite arcade game would have to be Wonder Boy Monsterland. It was a game that I grew up with with one of my um, childhood friends. Uh, we used to play it at a local milk bar, and I just, I just love it, absolutely love it. Ended up uh, finishing it as a kid too. Spent so many uh, 20 cent coins on that, on that game. Uh, look, I love it that much. I had actually purchased the English bootleg version um, a few years back to play at home. So yeah, it's it's Wonder Boy Monsterland. It's like I said, it's just uh, it's got so much. Uh, nostalgic value to me, if anything, and I still think it holds up today. It's a, it's a magnificent game. The story involves a dragon and his minions taking over the entire land and sending it into chaos, and only the kid himself, Wonder Boy, seemed to be the only person capable of setting things right. There were 12 huge stages to hack and slash your way through, and you could also pick up coins that you could use in shops to upgrade Wonder Boy with new items and weapons. It wasn't just a straight up A to B kind of game either, as there was tons of exploration and secrets to be found all over the place. The boss characters were devious as well, and having the right equipment for the task was essential to surviving them. One of the creators of this game and the previous game, Ryuchi Nishizawa, stated that they were trying to take advantage of the popular surge of RPGs in Japan by adding these types of elements into the action-adventure platform game. Ironically though, it wasn't an instant hit in Japan and was a slow burner but eventually became popular after the release of the Western home versions. And now onto Sega's big three Taikan Beast Machines, which were the reason at least for me as a kid to put down my C64 joystick and catch a train to the big city for something that I could just not experience at home on any level. These titles were Afterburner, Super Hang On and Thunderblade. Games that I always think of immediately when anybody ever says the word arcade. The first one up is Thunderblade, a third person and top down shooter helicopter simulator with a full on swiveling cabinet and force feedback abilities as you take out hordes of tanks and helicopters and jets with your chain gun or missiles. The game like so many in the 1980s was said to be inspired by the movie Blue Thunder and if you check out the title screen it's actually a still shot from the movie and some of the intermissions as well, clearly unlicensed as was the 1980s style. The excellent use of sprite scrolling really made the top down and third person views feel amazing, as was the big chunky sound effects. I got to play this game quite a number of times in its full Taikan mode, as it was at the same beachfront arcade as Space Harrier and Power Drift. Koichi Namiki, the game's composer, also delivered some great tunes, especially in the later stages of the game, and went on to compose many classic Sega soundtracks such as Galaxy Force and Super Monaco GP. And the sequel to Hang On was also released as well called Super Hang On, another massively impressive Taikan machine with a motorbike which now looked way more realistic compared to Hang On's red magic school bus. The game again was designed by Yu Suzuki and his AM2 team with music partly by Koichi Namiki who we just spoke about and this was another dynamite combination. The game was now massive with four locations from around the world to choose from and each one of those divided into multiple stages giving the game a lot of variety visually compared to the first. It also used Outrun's Choose Your Own Music, which was just awesome so you could actually load up your favorite track before burning rubber. I always chose Winning Run. Another big gameplay addition was the inclusion of a turbo button when you reach max speed, allowing you to blow past the competition on those long straightaways. The full bike version of the game became the second highest money earner in Japan behind Outrun, which was still number one after being out for over a year. I enjoyed Super Hang On even more more than the original. It was also possible for me to play it properly in the arcades as the bark was much smaller and my legs could actually reach the ground, making it possible for me to actually play it properly and get pretty far. There were also some really great ports to home systems, my two favourites being the excellent Amiga version and the
and the brilliant Mega Drive version, which also adds a complete career mode as well. And the last of Sega's big hitters was Afterburner, another Yu Suzuki gem, and probably next to Outrun his most popular game. Until the 90s anyway. Afterburner was the arcade's answer to the movie Top Gun, a pure adrenaline rush of speed and action as you pilot an F-14 Tomcat jet fighter, shooting up waves of enemies over 18 stages of action. It truly upped the ante on the Taycan experience with the full immersive cabinet replicating a cockpit, a seatbelt and massive hydraulic movement to simulate banking left and right. It was the game that everybody at the arcade wanted to play and I don't think I ever saw an empty seat on that game for more than a few minutes. Afterburner 2 was actually released in the same year and is actually just a simple update of the original, adding in the iconic throttle controls for even more immersive experience and a few other small upgrades. The graphics used sprite scrolling to its max, with both ground and sky scrolling pulled off with Sega's X-Board arcade system. The game was actually going to be set with you against the Soviets as the bad guys, with Sega hoping that would appeal more to Western audiences, but Suzuki ended up changing that in favor of an anonymous enemy giving the freedom to have the stages set anywhere and not trying to replicate Eastern European settings. The refueling stages and landings and takeoffs were implemented pretty late in the game as Suzuki felt players needed a second to breathe before the next onslaught of action. Kawaguchi was also back on the soundtrack and work-wise he went straight from Outrun to Afterburner and delivered another memorable soundtrack that absolutely rocks out and is one of the best of the 80s arcade scene next to Outrun of course. The game was a massive hit worldwide in its standard up and full Taycan versions and was one of the highest grossing arcade games in both Japan and the US in 1988 and remained in the top 10 all the way until 1990. And 87's final game was a title that defined a whole genre and it was Double Dragon, one of the 80s arcade's most popular titles and the beginning of the scrolling beat em up genre in its full form that would come to dominate arcade gaming for years to come with every company out there having a go at it. This was Yoshihisha Kishimoto's breakout game for tech and I don't remember visiting any big arcade that didn't have a double dragon cabinet. It was just that popular. The goal of this one or two player romp was to rescue Marion, a girlfriend of either or both or who knows characters Billy and Jimmy as they stomped their way across some New York streets, forests, mountains and some crazy James Bond boss heart out beating the hell out of everybody that crosses their path. All the tropes of the genre started here with Kishimoto expanding on one of his previous games Renegade with now full scrolling levels, hordes of henchmen with different fighting styles and weapons, items to pick up to throw and use against the enemies as you slap your way through to the big mental level boss. It had great cartoony graphics, the excellent two player co-op gameplay and the best punching sound effects this side of a Bud Spencer Terence Hill movie made Double Dragon a game you just had to play and a game that everybody did. Its success led to two other arcade scrolling sequels and one versus beat em up in 1995. We'll check out the sequel in 88 and the versus game which was actually Technos' last game before they went bust. But we'll be skipping Double Dragon 3 because honestly it's a total piece of garbage. The game also spawned countless home versions and sequels, most of them with their own additions in gameplay styles, but none in my opinion matched up to this Kishimoto classic. It's not perfect by any means and suffers from Technos' famous slowdown effect, has a simple spamming move which you can do to cheat your way through the whole game, but honestly who cares? After all, nothing is perfect. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. This is the 500X Jet from Epix. It is the highest scoring joystick that has ever been built. But what's even more amazing about the 500X Jet than how fast it can go is how it feels once you get there. You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z! With the return of consoles to people's homes being a success, arcade profits took a slight dip in 88, but not enough for a crash type catastrophe. It was still the place to get the latest cutting edge gaming. And with the introduction of the scrolling beat em up in full force and those big Taycan money makers, people were still flocking to get a sample of the best games could offer. But consoles were slowly catching up. It was only a matter of time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
but let's start off 1988 with a look at a nice little trilogy of Data East classics. So let's first check out my favorite game from them for this year, which was Robocop, a brilliant run and gun style action game based on the 1987 movie of the same name. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. You basically walk from left to right, shooting and punching street scum until you come up against some sort of boss character, like Ed 209 from the movie. Overall, it had seven levels in total, loosely following the plot points and set pieces from the movie, with a lot of filler. There's also some nice variety, like the first person shooting galleries, and features lots of voice samples and digitized images from the movie, which just adds to that Robocop atmosphere. The thing I remember most about this game was how brutally difficult it was in the arcades. If you didn't have a mountain of coins in your pocket, then you were history. The game ran off the same jammer board as Daddy East's other 88 game, Dragon Ninja, and gameplay wise, they both share a lot of the same similarities. This game was also ported by Ocean to every machine under the sun, with the European computer version selling over a million copies, making it one of the best selling computer games of the 1980s. It was also an extremely profitable and successful arcade game, leading to the inevitable sequel in movie form in 1990 and in arcade form in 1991, a game by Data East. Next was a pretty strange arcade release called Atomic Runner Chelnov, a side-scrolling platform running gunner with the exception that the screen is constantly scrolling, so you have no control over it, adding a large dose of strategic planning and jumping to the gameplay as you cannot go back on anything. It was a big seven level romp with the original story being your character, a miner named Chelnov who survives a nuclear power plant meltdown and gains inhuman abilities. Now there's a secret organization after you to try and gain the secrets of your powers. The game came under a lot of heat initially because people associated the game with trying to piggyback off the 1986 Chernobyl Russian nuclear meltdown disaster for profit. Data East had to make a television response in Japan where they weakly said Chalnov was simply Karnov's relative, another Data East character, and everything else was just purely coincidental, which is quite possibly the weakest response in media history. Later on, staff that actually worked on the game admitted that Chalnov's name was taken directly from Chernobyl, and all future ports of the game had the arcade plot completely removed. Despite all the hoopla though, this is still a pretty cool game with tons of awesome power-ups and weapons and some really smooth animation and graphics, which still make it an interesting game to try out if you never have. And Data Eats last game here was Dragon Ninja as I know it. It also goes under the name Bad Dudes, or the mouthful that is Bad Dudes vs Dragon Ninja, depending on where in the world you lived. It was a side-scrolling beat-em-up, much in the same vein as Kung Fu Master, but with just much more variety and crazy locations. The game has you as a pair of bad dudes, if played in two-player mode, of course, being tasked by the US Secret Service to rescue President Ronnie, a not-so-subtle reference to Ronald Reagan, the then US President, which all takes place in one of the most ham-fisted intros in gaming history. It's absolutely wonderful. You basically punch and kick your way through hordes of the Dragon Ninja gang, taking out bosses and picking up various weapons like nunchucks and knives. Naturally, the game had ninjas in it, making it super popular, especially amongst my friends at the arcades. And every time you saw this game, you just had to play it. It featured really good graphics and sound, cameos from other Data East characters such as Karnov and Chalnov, and was just a good fun romp all around. It ended up being in the top 5 money earners overall in Japan, the US and the UK in 1988 in the arcades, and ended up spawning tons of decent ports to home computers and consoles over the next few years. As you can imagine, since I did grow up in the United States, language barrier wasn't really an issue with arcades. Whether they were American, Japanese, they were just, they were a box that, you know, with a amazing experience on the screen. Uh, the arcade games that I did play were typically the localized uh, American version, so everything was already in English. I never found a language barrier between, you know, arcade machines from different countries. In fact, where the arcade machine came from, it never occurred to me as a kid. I think I may have encountered a Japanese import board at least at some point. I never ever used to read the instructions on the side of the cabinet. You, I could walk up to any arcade machine as a kid and you know probably more so than now I, you know you grab the joysticks and you, you sort of instinctively knew what to do. I don't remember much about that so I can't say that it actually was ever really a deterrent. Apart from looking at the buttons finding out you know what was fire what was jump at the you know the highest level that was me. 
And the Japanese companies continued to obliterate the arcades, just flooding them with the best Japan had to offer. And the best then was well above everybody else. And let's go back to a double dose of that favorite 80s theme, the Military Blast Fest, with two entries. The first is Cabal, or as me and my friends used to call it, Cable, by Tad Corporation, and published by Taito. Tad themselves were a pretty obscure Japanese arcade manufacturer, but still managed to slap out a few classics before they shut down in 1993. Most of their employees were made up of former workers from Data East, and their headquarters were in Mitakashi, Tokyo. This game in 89's Toki still remain fan favorites to this day. This awesome two-player third-person shooter, however, was a favorite of mine for many years. I just couldn't get enough of that addictive destroy everything on the screen gameplay. Like Operation Wolf, it's about killing a certain number of enemies before a stage ends and is jam-packed with five stages with each split into four pieces with some sort of crazy vehicle boss at the end of each one. There are also tons of power-ups to pick up and you can also lob some grenades for some added damage. Almost everything on screen could be destroyed. It featured really good graphics and the gameplay would be replicated many times by other companies with Natsumi's Wild Gun on the Super NES and Saibu Katsu's Dynamite Duke in 89, borrowing more than a few elements from this one. Cabal ended up getting a sequel of sorts by Tad also in 1990 called Blood Brothers, which we'll look at later. And SNK's military madness obsession continued with the excellent side-scrolling beat em up POW, Prisoner of War. This game was at one of the malls I used to frequent all the time, right next to the completely forgotten gangster shooter, Prohibition. I always used to jump between these two machines whenever I went there. POW itself was a one or two player beat em up with some shooter action as well, if you manage to pick up an M16. It has you escaping a prison from who knows where and killing everyone that gets in your way. Punches, kicks and various weapons like knives and machine guns could be picked up and used to make your escape. There were four stages in total to punch and shoot your way through. I love the sound effects in this game. Just those chunky punches and excellent explosion sounds and tart if a bit difficult gameplay made it one I always came back to. If you want an easy way to play this game then check out SNK's 40th anniversary collection which also includes many of their crazy military games. And while we're on the subject of beating stuff up let's take a look at Techno's follow-up to Double Dragon called, wait for it, Double Dragon 2 The Revenge. So remember the girl you wasted handfuls of quarters to save in Double Dragon 1? Well she gets blasted in the beginning of 2, so all that money of yours was completely wasted. And of course Billy and Jimmy go on an Eddie style revenge spree for her death. Yoshihisha Kishimoto is back as designer and he decided to adopt Renegade's directional attack method for gameplay, which does make this game feel very strange at first, especially if you're a Double Dragon expert. But after a bit of practice it works pretty well and again you get to slap your way through another four massive stages to the new gang's hideout. Besides the controls change though, this always felt like a bit of a remix to me rather than a true sequel. We have all the old enemies returned plus a few new ones and old and new weapons with solid graphics and again those fantastic punching sounds which really make this game so satisfying. It's not a bad game at all and cemented the scrolling beat em up genre in everyone's minds even more but wasn't as popular arcade wise as its predecessor. Still a beat em up well worth playing in retrospect. And on the techno front we got two radically different games. First was the beginning of a long running franchise called Ninja Gaiden, or as the arcade is known in Europe, Shadow Warriors. Both this arcade version and the NES version, which is a completely different game, were released at roughly the same time in 88. The arcade however is a scrolling beat em up, with the story being you're a ninja being hired to take out a crazy cult leader in the US. You slap your way through many US cities like New York, LA and Vegas to name a few. Besides smashing scenes to reveal bonuses. The main gameplay trope is the ability to jump and swing off objects, gymnastic styles and beat dudes up for some added ninja flair, like something out of that 80s cheese face movie, Jim Carter. I played this quite a few times in the arcades with a friend and in two player mode it is a hell of a lot more fun and I remember seeing the intro for the first time in the arcades with the ninja corpsing that Jason thug and thought it was absolutely epic. The game got lukewarm responses in Europe and Japan but in the US it was a massive monster hit and became one of the highest gross in arcades overall in 1989. Tecmo's other game was Silkworm, a horizontal scrolling shoot 'em up where you could take the role of either a jeep or a helicopter for its blasting action or two player co-op it, which is really how this game should be played and where most of its fun came in. Plenty of power ups could be picked up and in two player mode you definitely had to cooperate with each other as it's easier for certain vehicles to shoot at certain angles. I used to play this a lot on my Commodore 64, just like Cabal, as practice and then go and use those skills in the arcade. The 
strange thing was that Silkworm and Ninja Gaiden were at one point in the late 80s situated next to each other in my local cafe. So I got a double dose of techno for a good few months before they swapped out the cabinets. It sported really good graphics, although the enemies are repeated way too much in this game. But the fun of the two player co-op mode makes this totally worth seeking out regardless. And RM also had two very different style but extremely cool games which I played so much back then. The first was Vigilante, which is in essence an updated version of RM's own Kung Fu Master. RM themselves were developing the Kung Fu Master sequel in 1987, but it received really poor feedback from location testing, which made them decide to change up the game's setting and location to give it a more dirty American street thug vibe, and thus this led to the release of Vigilante in 88. Gameplay wise, it's exactly the same though, where you have to rescue your girlfriend Madonna from a bunch of street scum for no apparent reason. Cue the five stages of beat em up action. You could punch, kick and pick up weapons like nunchucks and knives. They can also grab you Kung Fu Master style and drain your energy and every level ended with a boss style goon to slap up. It featured really good graphics with a unique cartoony style that I really loved and excellent sound effects that really made every punch and kick feel very satisfying. It was a cool update of a classic game. And the other game continued the 80s obsession with ninjas with Ninja Spirit, a platform style shooter action game. Your character is on a quest to avenge his father's death. Gameplay is very precise and satisfying with you able to access a whole arsenal of weapons straight off the bat. Being able to switch between them quickly for different situations is the real gameplay trick. Your ninja also dies with a one hit kill so the stakes are really high and I'd usually find this extremely annoying but this game has a very distinctive flow to it making it possible even if you're a mediocre gamer to get pretty far and have fun. Upgrades to your weapons and the ability to multiply yourself to turn the game into an almost shoot 'em up style experience was a very cool idea. There were seven stages in total with some epic bosses and it has wonderful small detail graphics and a great soundtrack to complement it. It's a bit of a forgotten gem I feel and one of my favorite RM games ever. And now over to one of the heavy hitters, Taito. Let's first take a look at another toe plane shooter released through them. This one being called Truxton, a vertically scrolling blast fest affair. Truxton is a very beginner friendly shoot em up that's easy to get into and doesn't try to overwhelm you in some sort of bullet hell type setting. Instead relies on pattern and gives you an abundance of powerful weapons. That definitely sways the odds in your favor, making it an extremely fun and satisfying shoot 'em up that sends you through five massive levels. And of course, gives you access to some cool screen destroying bombs and plenty of other flash. Masahiro Yuge was both producer and composer of this gem, and it definitely harkens back to his slower paced, more meticulous slap fight style, but just much easier to play. It was the first toe playing game to actually have their name featured in the title screen which really started to build their name as creators of quality shoot 'em ups The game was very successful in Japan and sold well, but was completely overlooked in Western countries upon original release. It's since become a well-respected classic with a particularly cool Mega Drive version also available. Next was Taito back to their cutesy platformer style game, which they did so well with the excellent New Zealand story. A fast paced action platform maze game where you have to shoot your way through levels and trying to find the exit and rescue your Kiwi friends who have been kidnapped by a giant blue seal. Your Kiwi is equipped with bow and arrows, but those can be upgraded to bombs, lasers and much more. It features four levels, each split into four parts with bosses at the end of each. The game also runs on a strict time limit, so beelining it for the exit is the actual goal. There are balloons to ride and warp gates to find, which all help you get to the exit faster. Although it ended up being nowhere near as popular as Bubble Bobble, it's still an extremely fun and well-made platformer, with detailed graphics and a bubbly soundtrack that gets stuck in your head. And lastly from Taito was my favorite from them for this year which was Chase HQ, a vehicle combat style game where you play a bunch of cops, Gibson and Brody who are basically Crockett and Tubbs from Miami Vice as you speed on after criminals and run them off the road and take them into custody. Each of the five levels is introduced by Nancy who calls you on the radio giving you a description of the criminal's car you're trying to run down. Then it's a race against the clock to catch up to them and smash their car up until they can't move anymore. Each of the criminals has their own sports car, hence your special chase team, who also happen to have a sports car equipped, are the only people available to deal with this special type of scum. I played the sit down version of this in the arcades many many times, and it was always so much fun. It received a direct sequel in 1989 called Special Criminal Investigation, which we'll look at later, and two other arcade releases with the madness that is known as Super Chase in 1992, and the kind of forgettable arcade version 
version of Chase HQ2 in 2007. The cabinet ended up in the top five money earners for 89 in Japan and was extremely popular in the UK, becoming one of its top earners there as well. Next, let's check out a double dose of Blood Soaked Mayhem with Splatterhouse from Namco and Narc from Williams. Both of these games epitomize the 80s I don't care what you think style, with each being as violent and offensive as you could possibly get away with back then. Splatterhouse itself holds the distinct honor of being the first arcade with a parental advisory warning, with Narc also having the honor of being the first arcade to sport a 32-bit processor. So let's check out Splatterhouse first, which was a side-scrolling hack and slash where you play Rick, a dude who gets possessed by an evil Jason style mask. You then have to hack and butcher your way through a haunted mansion you were in to save your girlfriend Jennifer. You know, that old chestnut. Gameplay involves walking from left to right, avoiding all types of traps and punching and kicking zombies and mutants, as well as picking up an assortment of weapons such as poles, machetes and shotguns. The fun of the game is trying to guess at all the horror references they keep throwing at you. Combined with the iconic organ style music, the game was just dripping with atmosphere. Unfortunately, I never got to play this in the arcade originally. In fact, I never saw this game in any arcade, but I first got to play the series on my Mega Drive with Splatterhouse 2 and 3 and absolutely loved those games. Just like the movies that inspired it though, it's become a lot more respected and appreciated as time has gone on and is an excellent start to a cool scrolling hack and slash series. The other Blood Soaked classic was Narc, released by Williams, and another great game designed by Eugene Jarvis of Robotron and Defender fame. This one was a one or two player side scrolling run and gunner where you get to play a bunch of Narc cops who get sent out on a mission to apprehend Mr. Big, the head cheese of the drug empire. It's a chaotic, fast paced game, like all of Eugene's creations, with you blasting junkies and picking up their cash and drugs. You can also arrest them, but who wants to do that when you have unlimited machine gun fire and also limited rockets to blast the street scum to pieces. You could even jump into a Porsche for some Carmageddon style action. The 32-bit processor used in the game was later used by Williams and Midway for Smash TV, Mortal Kombat and NBA Jam. I loved this game in the arcades and would play it at any chance I saw it. The awesome use of digitized graphics and speech and the absolute carnage of the gameplay just made it way too much fun, especially in two-player mode where the screen was just smothered in action. Another well-made Eugene gem. And now back to the big boys of the arcade scene. Capcom, Sega and Namco. And let's start with Capcom who had Goals and Ghosts and Forgotten Worlds this year. Goals and Ghosts which was the sequel to 1985's highly successful Ghosts and Goblins. It follows on the gameplay of the previous title with just bigger and better levels, graphics and sound. There are six levels in total which sport wonderfully detailed graphics and creatures. The game again was designed by Takuro Fujiwara with an excellent music score by Tamayo Kawamoto which was her last Capcom soundtrack before joining Zuntata. The story has the demons coming for revenge and stealing the soul of Arthur's beloved. His quest now is to restore peace to the land and recover his girlfriend's soul. Gameplay for the most part is the same and just as difficult as before but with way more power up and allowing you to acquire special armor that can be charged for a cool screen style killer effect and the ability to shoot up which is used in some of the flying levels as well. This game definitely takes everything from the original and dials it up to 10 making it an excellent if not a little bit too difficult sequel to the original classic. The arcade version received much praise from across the press at the time and ended up being in the top 10 money earners in Japan for 1989. The other Capcom game was Forgotten Worlds, a one or two player side scrolling shoot 'em up. You were tasked with destroying the all powerful Bio and all his other eight gods and win back Earth or what's left of it after their takeover. The game is notable as being the first released on the now legendary Capcom CPS1 arcade board, which was put into production two years prior by Capcom President Ken. Enzo Sujimoto, who was worried by the massive success of the new slate of console games we're having and famously said, the only way we can make money is to give people twice what they can get at home. Two and a half years later and almost $10,000 in development costs, the board was on display, with Forgotten Worlds being its test subject. It was worked on by a team of Capcom legends, with both Akamoto on design, Kawamoto on sound and music, animation and design by Kiro Yasuda, who would later work on Street Fighter 2 and Final Fight 
and Akira Nishitani, who would later form the company Arika and develop the awesome Street Fighter EX series. The game was a flagship for the company and its talent. They tried as hard as they could to push the board to the limit and make a game stand out from the glut of shooters at the time. It featured non-diverse looking stages, a rotatable control scheme, allowing you to blast stuff from all angles, a wonderful soundtrack and effects, shops dotted around the stages to buy power-ups and upgrades, and some truly spectacular looking bosses and character designs. Having said all that, the game was slightly lost in the shoot 'em up crowd at the time, garnering great reviews and decent profits, but not really what Capcom were hoping for. It did, however, win first place in a Japanese magazine called Gamist, which covered the arcade scene at the time, with it winning best graphics for 1988. Fortunately, the previous game we looked at, Girls and Ghosts, was a huge success on all fronts, cementing the CPL legend which Capcom used to great effect for the next few years. And now over to Namco with their update of the beloved Galaxian saga called Galaga 88, the often forgotten entry in the series. Gameplay was mostly the same, with just really enhanced graphics and sound and music composed by Hiroyuki Kawada, which was accomplished as the game was running on Namco's new System 1 arcade board. The game featured five distinct levels and the ability to have up to three ships on screen for you to blast away with. The game was released in December 87 in Japan, but I included it in 88 as the title and wide release more suit that. It was very successful in Japan, being the sixth highest moneymaker that year, but failed miserably in the rest of the world. Atari, who distributed the game in North America, only ended up selling just over 900 cabinets of the game in 88, making it for the most part one of the most forgotten entries in the excellent Galaxian series. Although in retrospect, it's a fantastic game and a must play. Namco's other game, Winning Run, was a first-person Formula One racing simulator using their then System 21 arcade board dubbed the Polygonizer, and it was specifically designed for 3D polygon processing with fully shaded colored polygon graphics. Namco were the kings of Formula One games at that time and wanted this to be their showcase game. It took three years to make, but boy did the graphics and tight simulation style gameplay blow people away at the time. The game was a full Tycoon experience, something you could obviously only experience in the arcades. The graphics were fast paced, it played well, and Kawada again supplied music and sound effects that complement the game exceptionally. It was a precursor to what Sega would do later with the Virtua series, and was a big hit in its home country. It again received lukewarm responses internationally, at least financially, but the game received some rave reviews from Western publications, with Julian Rignall in the 1989 issue of C Plus VG saying, simply stunning, easily the best racing game yet seen. It's thoroughly realistic and totally exhilarating. This led to two exclusive Japan-only arcade sequels, with Winning Run Suzuka GP and Winning Run 91, which both feel more like add-on variations, although the original eventually saw some measure of success commercially when it was released in the US arcades in early 1990. And finally, let's finish 88 stellar year off with Sega and five titles I want to highlight. First is a strange entry called Game Ground, a kind of strategy action game, and something you wouldn't normally see in an arcade. Your goal is simply to make your way to the exit or kill everybody on screen. The strategy comes in with your different characters who all have different weapons and stats. Tackling the levels is a much slower paced methodical approach as opposed to a run and gun style which is probably the reason I only played this game once in the arcade and never again. I did however come to appreciate this game later through its Mega Drive form and it's quite an addictive game if you stick with it. The first few levels of the game are pretty bland but keep going and it becomes really good. Altered Beast is next the loved or hated side-scrolling beat-em-up. I remember playing this at a gas station for the first time after going to see the doctor as I was sick. Every time you stopped in one of these places, the fun was always running on inside the storefront and seeing if they had arcades. And sure enough, they had this. The game pits you on a quest in ancient Greece to rescue Zeus's daughter, Athena, who's been kidnapped by an underworld demon. You know, that old chestnut. The game was running off Sega's System 16 arcade board, which allowed the huge detailed sprites and excellent visual look of this game. Designer of the game, Makoto Uchida, who would later go on and join Sega's excellent AM2 arcade team, said the inspiration for the game came from the Joe Dante movie, The Howling, and the Michael Jackson music video.
video thriller. In the game, you punch and kick your way through Greek mythology, picking up orbs to power yourself up. After a few of them, you can transform into a beast, a different one depending on the level, which gives you enhanced power and moves to take everybody out. The gameplay can be pretty clunky at times, but the sound and visuals and variety in the levels I think still outweigh the bad points, at least the arcade version. Next was Wonder Boy 3 Monsters Lair, which was the third game in the series and probably the one I played the most, at least in the arcade form. It takes the series back to its origins with its fast-paced side-scrolling platformer shooter action. Just like the first, your health is always depleting, so collecting fruit to keep alive and blasting everything else with an excellent assortment of weapons was the main gameplay elements. Besides the light platforming, you got to ride dragons in fast-paced shoot 'em up sequences, followed by big boss battles. I love the visual look of this game, and it features an excellent score by Shiniki Sakamoto, who also did the music on Monsterland, the previous entry in the series. And this one personally has some of my favorite Wonder Boy tracks. We used to play this game in two-player style so much back then, which leaves me with really fond memories of this game, and I think it's a kind of overlooked entry in the series. And the last two games were the big Taikan experiences from Sega. The games they just did so well. Galaxy Force was the first, a sort of space sci-fi version of Afterburner, where you are a lone ship taking on an alien empire bent on galaxy domination. It was a third-person blasting experience with you equipped with lasers and limited supply of heat-seeking missiles. It was another big super scalar marvel to play in its original big sit-down version. Most of the team working on this game also ended up in Sega's AM2 division in the early 90s, and this game was in production at the exact same time as Power Drift. Visually it was amazing with a cool soundtrack by the team behind the Thunderblade tracks. I was fortunate enough again to play this game in its deluxe form, which like Thunderblade took the game to a whole new level. Just like Afterburner however, Galaxy Force 2 was released two months after the original and was simply an updated version, fixing a few bugs and adding a few more levels to the game. It wasn't a sequel, just merely a modded update and all the footage here is from that version. It's reported that the super deluxe versions of the game ran Sega in at $30,000 a piece in 1988. That's around $60,000 plus at current rates, which made the version a very rare sight to find in most arcades. It ended up doing really, really well financially, especially in North America, despite the fact that the machines were only in half the arcades at the time. And finally, the other Taycan experience was Power Drift, an insane kart-like racing game running on Sega's wireboard, which allowed the sprites and backgrounds to all rotate and scale, making it truly feel like you were going on some sort of crazy roller coaster ride. The game was headed up by Yu Suzuki with music again by Kawaguchi, and the team produced another fantastic arcade experience. It featured five distinctive levels where the goal is to place at least third in each race to keep moving forward. Each crazy character and tracks themselves are just bursting at the seams with personality, and the insane fast paced nature of the game was like nothing else at the time. I used to play this again often in one arcade with its full sit down motion version and it just used to slap a massive smile on my face from the moment the coin dropped and that jamming Kawaguchi music started blaring. Even watching somebody else play this was just as much fun. It ended up being the fourth biggest arcade moneymaker overall in Japan in 88 and is considered by many as the original kart racing game and probably something Nintendo definitely looked at before making Mario Kart. And with that this brings 1988 to a close. It was finally here, the end of the 80s arcade decade, which had the biggest highs and lows the industry would ever see. But somehow things continued despite all this. And the final 31 games I want to highlight here finish off arguably the strongest decade in gaming from a single format that I can think of. Just bursting with quality and originality and more games pushing the then technology to the max. So let's mix it up a little bit here for the final batch and we'll jump through these 31 games by genres. which really shows technology wise where each company was at the time. And we'll start off with the two odd ones out, that being Beast Busters by SNK and Exterminator by Gottlieb. Beast Busters was an on rails light gun shooter where you play a bunch of military dudes trying to escape a city that has been overrun by zombies and mutants. It's noted for being the first light gun game that could feature up to three players at once which obviously in turn makes it probably one of the most chaotic light gun games I've ever played and made arcade owners very 
very rich with three people playing at once. It featured nice chunky Uzis like Operation Wolf and was just a continuous onslaught of action from beginning to end with seven stages in total. Tons of power-ups could be had, bosses all over the place and hilariously cheeseball cutscenes. It was basically a B-grade horror movie in game form. It was Japan's number one ranked game in January 1990 and number two in North America during their first quarter. The other game Exterminator by Gottlieb, which was also their last arcade video game they ever made before continuing on with Pinball as the focus. It was a light gun game of sorts, in style at least, but without light guns. You take control of a couple of pest control guys cleaning up the neighborhood of bugs. You control a hand from a first person view and kill cockroaches by squishing them or using bug spray or various other items. You even get to shoot lasers out of your finger. Yeah, somebody at Gottlieb was taking a lot of cocaine apparently. <laughs> you make your way through each house clearing them out room by room and there are seven houses in total in the neighborhood. The graphics are unique as it's the first time to feature fully digitized graphics for both your hand and all the backgrounds. It's actually pretty impressive for the time and features tons of digitized sound effects as well. The game in the arcades at least failed to catch on and disappeared pretty quickly. Although the home versions fared much better and garnered great reviews at the time and I played the Commodore 64 version quite a lot as I never actually saw this arcade anywhere. Definitely a strange game to try out if you're curious. Now let's check out a selection of shoot 'em ups, eight of my favorites, which were Prehistoric Isle, Dragon Breed, UN Squadron, Saint Dragon, R-Type 2, Bioshock, Zero Wing, and Hellfire. Now that's a lineup. Let's first take a look at Topland's three entries. Bioshock was a vertically scrolling shooter and the sequel to 1987's Flying Shark. It didn't do anything radically different and is basically Flying Shark in a new setting and graphics. It's still every bit as tough and if you're not up for a challenge it's not going to be for you. It features 10 stages overall as you attempt to take out a military force that's launching a worldwide assault from the island base. The game proved to be much more popular to western audiences according to Masahiro Yuge and got lukewarm responses in Japan where it was originally released simply due to the game being too difficult. Toplan followed this up with two horizontal shooters namely Zero Wing and Hellfire. Both these titles employed different gameplay mechanics to make them feel fresh for a genre that was already at this point a bit of a cliche unto itself. Zero Wing employed a technique where you could track a beam in an enemy ship and use it as a shield or blast it off making a missile out of it for extra damage and Hellfire brought a really well put together rotatable gun system where changing the direction and fire is imperative to each situation bringing a large dose of strategy to a simple shooter. Both feature outstanding graphics both in their own unique styles as well as pumping music from Yuge and team. Zero Wing was actually not even meant for commercial release as it was a base model game Toplan would use to train new staff to the company on how to make a great shoot 'em up. Hence the reason the game is a bit all over the place in terms of tone as it was being put together by everybody in the staff. Despite that though the game proved to be really popular and as per Toplan tradition features an excellent Mega Drive version as well. Hellfire itself was actually Toplan's first horizontal shooter and it was said they had real difficulty nailing down the style for both of these games leading them to basically stick to vertical shooters for the rest of the company's lifespan. It featured six pretty tough levels and the quick switching of your weapon type and its upgrade ability really made this one stand out from the crowd. Tatsuya Uemura who had been a composer at Toplan up until that point and did great work on Flying Shark and Twin Cobra was the lead producer this time. The game was actually being developed at the same time as Truxton but with the team's lack of horizontal experience it took way longer to finish. Both this and Zero Wing shared the same game engine. The game arcade wise got a little bit lost in the shuffle but again would receive a lot more popularity in its Mega Drive release version which was well received at the time. And next up was UN Squadron. Capcom wasn't new to the shoot 'em up genre at all, having already made notable games in the genre such as Legendary Wings and Forgotten Worlds. So they had good experience in this style, which was released on their powerhouse CPS arcade hardware that was used extensively during that period. The game was based on the Japanese manga called Area 88 and was renamed UN Squadron for Western audiences who were no doubt unfamiliar with that series. English versions of some of that series were released through Viz Comics and I highly recommend you checking them out. They are pretty good reads. This is also a rare shoot 'em up for the time that actually has a bit of a story and plays out traditionally between the levels and has a group of pilots trying to take down the secret terrorist group known as Project 4. This game ticks all the horizontal shoot 'em up cliches while bringing the unique aspect of an energy bar instead of a 
one hit kills or losing all your weapons which was pretty much the standard for every shooter during this period. Being able to take a number of hits made the game way more accessible to casuals as well, but that didn't mean the game was easy. It's still a tough little bastard, but with the energy bar and the relatively short levels, it made it possible to at least survive for more than 5 minutes before slapping in another quarter. Being able to purchase weapons at the end of each level was very cool as well, and that had definitely been lifted from Capcom's previous shooter hit, Forgotten Worlds. Overall, there are 10 levels to blast through and 3 unique characters to choose from straight out of the manga. Shin has forward fire only, but at a rapid pace. Maki's ones are slower but do way more damage, and Greg has small forward shot but he also has a secondary low firing shot weapon that takes out ground targets. Choosing what style suits you is pretty tough, but Shin is my usual choice having been a pretty well rounded character. Each level is pretty short as previously mentioned and ends with the traditional boss battle, taking the form of a giant tank, stealth bombers, castle fortresses and many more other crazy things. The graphics are excellent and have that very unique CPS hardware look that is part anime, part 16 bit sprite goodness and <laughs> it still looks great even playing it now. It's complemented by a cool soundtrack by Manami Matsu Sume, who was no slouch in the music department, having composed Mercs and Magic Sword soundtracks amongst many more at Capcom. We never got to see a proper sequel despite the game being very popular at the time, but Capcom's 1990 release called Carrier Airway is often considered the spiritual successor to this game, sharing more than a few similarities, combined with look and style that also makes it a must play shooter. The easiest way probably to play this game now is picking up the excellent Super Famicom or Super NES versions, which are both extremely well made arcade conversions. If you've never played this 1989 game then there's no better time to dive into this often overlooked CPS system gem. To be honest I didn't find any problems with the language barrier at all. No not really so um, when I was a kid I taught myself English uh, by playing Donald Duck's Playground on the C64. And uh, watched Ninja Turtles and WWF from, you know, age three. Oh, yeah! There are arcade games, and I hardly read through the story anyway. And taught myself English, so I never had that issue. My friends did. Uh, when we go to the arcades in summer, uh, I would notice a lot of times that they never quite, even though it would be simplistic games, like Fall Fight, this kind of stuff, but I would notice kind of like if I pointed out something to pick up or something in the game and using the English word for it you know they wouldn't quite catch on until I kind of pointed at it it's like it's that thing so I didn't have that challenge but I know kids did there was nothing nothing I, I could that I had any trouble with to be honest luckily though in the arcade sense language barriers didn't really exist as much you know unless you played like Wonder Boy I guess uh, the Japanese version. Next was a non-SNK military game called Prehistoric Isle. It was a horizontal shooter set in the 1930s in the Bahamas as you go to investigate what happened to a bunch of missing pilots who disappeared over a fictional island. Which leads to the most fun part of this game which is the setting as the island is infested with dinosaurs. Gameplay is a bit like Hellfire and R-Type mixed together with you able to gain a drone which can be positioned for different types of fire which you have to change rapidly as the screen also moves up vertically from time to time as well. It didn't do anything unique but the cool setting made it seem fresh and sports wonderful sprite based graphics and cool dinosaur boss encounters. And the first of two Mecha Dragon games was next called Saint Dragon, a horizontal shooter by Jellico. You play a cyborg dragon who is rebelling against the system. It employed a really cool metallic graphic art design and the gameplay trope besides upgrading your dragon was the ability to use and wrap your dragon's tail around yourself or in front of yourself as a shield. It felt fresh and had five massive levels and got a bunch of really good home ports in the early 90s. Definitely worth checking out. The other dragon based shooter was Dragon Breed by RM, one of two fantastic shooters from this company that year. Dragon Breed has you take control of a dragon which you can ride. Not only does it feature standard shooter levels but you can also jump off the dragon in certain sections for light run and gun style platforming action. It also features the same dragon tail technique where you can use your dragon's tail as a shield and also features a charge shot and the usual assortment of power ups. 
Hearts. It features big, gorgeous graphics and a pumping soundtrack. And I love playing this game whenever I saw it in the arcades. It's such a top quality shooter. Irem's other gem was my favorite shooter of 89, which was Artar 2, the sequel to 87's classic. It was more of the same as the original, just with more weapons and much more detailed graphics and boss encounters. You again have to invade the Bido Heart and blow up the alien clone factory set up on their homeworld. I really love the first level of this game as it's a cool throwback to the original as you re-enter their base, featuring six levels, although the real ending can only be seen if you completed the game twice. So good luck on that, as it's definitely way more difficult than the original. My only real complaint here is the return of that really annoying checkpoint system, meaning if you die before the halfway point in a level you get thrown all the way back to the beginning. Not cool RM. But if you can get over this hurdle and have a hell of a lot of coins in your pocket, this is just fantastic and it plays so well and was the second most popular game in Japan in January 1990 and hung around the top 10 for most of that year. It doesn't deviate much from the original, but it's still a well crafted shooter everyone should have a go at. And now let's go over to a bunch of run and gun platform games. I have none that are must play titles. Let's first check out Capcom's two entries, Willow and Strider. Willow itself was based on the 1988 movie of the same name written by George Lucas and directed by Ron Howard. The game takes a bit of a loose approach to the subject matter but still has you as either the two main characters of Mad Mardigan and Willow as you attempt to take down the evil queen Bav Morda. The game has six stages, from the crossroads where you meet Mad Mardigan to the snow-capped peaks of Sorcerer's Camp, all the way to Bav Morda's Castle of Doom. The variety of the stages is quite diverse and they even add the wagon fight and the shield ride sequence from the movie. The gameplay falls into the platform genre and depending on which character you're playing, it's either running gun or hack and slash. Most of the levels alternate between you controlling Willow who uses long range magic attacks and Man Mardigan who uses a sword for close quarters death dealing. Everything that is killed in the game drops money which can be used to buy items in the shop to upgrade either character. The music is your typical arcade fare of the time. It's nothing memorable at all and there isn't a single tune that stuck with me after finishing the game. It's a pity they didn't do some variations on the movie soundtrack but that had a fantastic score. It's still overall a really good run and gun platform style game and if you like the movie you absolutely will love this game. Capcom's other platform run and gunner or hack and slash was Strada. The game was a collaboration with manga artist Moto Kikaku and the manga was released in 1988. The game was another beautiful CPS entry taking place in a dystopian Russian future where you as the ninja Hiryu have to assassinate the ruling dictator, the Grand Master. The game features five massive stages with the game employee lots of hack and slash platforming action, massive weapon upgrades and boss encounters around every corner. Here you is very diverse, being able to somersault and climb up almost anything and the fast paced nature of the game means you'll barely get a second to breathe in all that intense action. It's an excellent game and went down like a storm in the UK where the arcade held onto the top spot for 3 months straight. It received a home console and computer sequel by US Gold in 1990 but Capcom's true arcade sequel would only come in 90 1999 in the arcades and PS1 as Strata 2. Data East also had a double dose with Midnight Resistance and Sly Spa. Midnight Resistance brought back the old military run and gun shooter in platforming style form and was a one or two player romp as you attempt to rescue your family from King Crimson. The arcade featured a rotatable control scheme, the same as Akari Warriors allowing you to shoot in all directions while running. As you blast your way through the nine stages, collecting keys from certain killed enemies, the keys depending on how many you have can open lockers at the end of a level so you can gain access to new weapons. I only ended up playing this a couple times in the arcade and ended up enjoying the home ports a lot more. Slicebar on the other hand was an arcade game I played to death. I mean who didn't want to be James Bond as a kid. The game was also known as Secret Agent in Japan or in Europe as Slicebar Secret Agent. Fly by. This game combines lots of different gameplay styles from scrolling shooter, vehicle combat and of course platform running gun action with a bit of a beat em up angle as well. Data East were covering all their bases on this one with its 8 stages. The game has you take the role of a secret agent tasked with taking down a terrorist organization known as the Council for World Domination. 
Not very subtle, are they? And stop them from launching a nuke. That old chestnut. You have some shinobi style running gun sections, shooter sections, and some vehicle action as well. Every stage is like a set piece from a James Bond movie. And like Splatterhouse, which we looked at earlier, it's just fun to try and guess what the next reference is when you're playing it. There's bits from The Man with the Golden Gun, Moonraker, Goldfinger, and a whole lot more. And it sports excellent detailed graphics and a great soundtrack, mimicking a few James Bond tunes as well. And was an arcade I just love seeing. I played it probably as much as I played the C64 home port I had at the time. Just pure arcade fun at its best. And Sega weren't going to be left out of the action. They also had a double dose with the sequel to Shinobi named Shadow Dancer and Cyber Police eSWAT. Shadow Dancer was the first game to debut on Sega's new System 18 arcade board, which also powered 1990's excellent Alien Storm, and is the basis also for the Sega Mega Drive. The gameplay is just like Shinobi, but instead of rescuing your clan members, you now defuse bombs set around the city by some whack job terrorist group. There are four different missions, each split into multiple parts with boss characters and a shuriken bonus stage, just like the original. The biggest difference though is that you actually have a dog companion which can help you out and mortal bad guys, giving you the time to land that killing blow, which is a cool mechanic. The ninja magic is also present for desperate times and the graphics took a major upgrade with some good sound effects and music as well. It's a pretty good sequel that doesn't deviate too much from the original, so if you like Shinobi, it's well worth checking out. Cyber Police eSWAT manages to mix Data East Robocop and Sega's own Shinobi together for the best of both worlds. The game has you as a member of Liberty City Police Force, tasked with arresting the worst scum of the earth, and in turn bring down a terrorist organization bent on world domination. Yeah, that old chestnut I guess. You start off just as a regular cop with Robocop style gameplay, blasting things, arresting a bunch of scum, until you get promoted to eSWAT and receive a cool mech suit kitted out with fancy weapons, with even more special weapons to be found in each stage. There's really a lot of fun jumping around the levels, blasting punks and criminal scumbags. It can be pretty difficult though, but well worth a go, with really nice big colourful graphics and sound effects. Sega also made a Mega Drive Genesis version in 1990 called eSWAT. City Under Siege, which the game is more commonly known as. And the last three run and gun style games I want to show are Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters. Toki and Rambo 3, all quite different in their own way. First up is Atari's ode to the 1950s and 60s B movies. You know the ones where this happens. A lot. Not since the beginning of time has man known such terror. They released the mouthful that is Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters, an isometric run and gun style game where robots are forcing the scientists to manufacture more robots to power their army. You get sent to Planet X to sort this nonsense out, gun in hand. Gameplay is a one or two player shoot fest where you take out robots, rescue hostages, flip switches to go to new areas, and even have some spaceship style sequences between levels. The excellent attention to detail in not only the graphics but sound wise is its best feature and feels very unique in look and in style to anything around at that time. It's a really cool game with a lot to like. Toki was another under the radar arcade release from TAD Corporation, the guys that did Cabal. It was a platform running gunner where you had to defeat a wizard who had cast a spell on you, turning you into an ape. And of course there's a princess to save as well, because why not? Toki, or Juju as he's known in the Japanese or various other versions, has to rush his way through stages relying on your ape spit attack and avoiding enemies, as the game employs the joyous one-hit kill mechanic and make it before the timer runs out. I played this one quite a lot of times in the arcade and always liked it, despite its really hard difficulty. It has big, chunky, well-animated graphics and really nice variety in stage design, always made it a fun one for me to look out for. It pretty much disappeared into a void upon release, but has definitely gained a strong fan following, no doubt thanks to some cool home ports, both old and new, keeping the game's legacy alive. And lastly was Rambo 3 by Taito, which was a third person on rails run and gunner based on the third Rambo movie. He never draws first blood. He only fights back. It's straightforward simplicity at its best. This one or two player game, with the second player taking the role of Troutman, who Rambo has to rescue in the movie. You have unlimited machine gun fire, plus some explosive arrows from your bow to take out the bigger vehicles. 
The stages vary from left to right Operation Wolf style shoot fests to a third person Space Harrier type sequences where hordes of enemies are coming at you before facing off against a level boss. This game was just good dumb fun. It's not great in any way, although the sprite scaling graphics were quite impressive for the time. The simple repetitive explosive action always made me smile and it's even much more fun in two player mode. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Now over to the racing genre, both traditional and destruction types with eight titles. The first is SCR or Special Criminal Investigation, the sequel to Chase HQ, a game by Taito. It doesn't stray too far from the original, with the gameplay addition of you being able to lean out your window and shoot the criminal as well as ram him for double hit damage. Gibson and Brody are back for more action with upgraded graphics and sound but still essentially the same overall gameplay. It's still highly enjoyable though, it scored big in the arcades, with it being ranked number 3 overall in Japan financially for 1990 and again becoming extremely popular in the UK, probably helped by the fact that the microcomputers of the day also got some really good home parts. Sega had 3 racing gems that are a bit overlooked for whatever reason but are really good fun drivers. They were Super Monaco GP, Racing Hero and Turbo Outrun. This is a sequel to the original arcade game Outrun which came out in 1986 and was designed by legend Yu Suzuki. Most of the same team from Sega's AM2 division worked on this arcade sequel, including Hiroshi Miyauchi, who composed the original Immortal soundtrack. And although this isn't quite as good as that, it still has some rocking Sega tunes to get you in the mood for tearing down those highways. In this version, you have to race across the USA, from New York to LA, and features 16 stages in total. Unlike the original, you cannot choose your path and there's only one to follow, but there are a bunch of extra features to make up for this. First, as the name suggest your Ferrari is outfitted with a turbo booster to send the car into overdrive for brief periods of time. You can't use it all the time or else the car overheats, so you've got to keep a reasonable balance between driving well and using it on those nice long straights or to boost start after a crash. Another cool aspect is that after every four stages you get to take a break and have a chance to choose an upgrade for your car from a souped up engine, better gripping tires or an enhanced turbo feature. And the last major addition is you're racing against an opponent as well as the time clock. If he beats you to the last of the four checkpoints, your girlfriend would ditch you and join him for the next leg of the race. So much for true love. Is this game as good as the original? Mm, no, it's not. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It's still a very cool, fun, fast-paced arcade ride with good graphics, a cracking soundtrack, and tons of variety in its 16 stages to make it a game still well worth a go on MAME or the arcade original if you can still find one kicking about. Racing Hero was next, a sort of variation on Outrun and Hang On mashed together. It ran on the excellent Sega X board, just like Power Drift, and is a motorcycle racing game to the checkpoints, just like Outrun, on real roads, which made the unpredictability of the racing such a rush. The sprite scaling is excellent and fast, and the soundtrack is vastly underrated, and the courses jump you all over the world for a nice dose of variety. It was a cool game that again got lost in 1989's overdose of big titles. Although C Plus VG Magazine did give the game a 92% overall in their August 1990 issue. And I also think that the lack of home ports makes this one even more obscure to most people. Lastly from Sega was the brilliant Super Monaco GP, the sequel to 1979's Monaco GP. This was another Sega export game that they were really cashing in on at the time. It was a first person style Formula 1 racing game that takes place on the famous Monaco track. Even though the game circuit is part reality and part fiction to spice it up a little bit. This game really made you feel the speed with massive fast graphics which were running at 60 frames per second at the time and a deluxe cabinet version which I unfortunately never got to play having a system called Air Drive which blew air onto you as you played to add to the realism. It was Sega racing at its best, pure arcade fun with on point gameplay and great sprite scaling and rocking music. It's all the things that made Sega cabinets so desirable. The arcade game was a massive hit all over the world in 
all regions. It ended up second only to Namco's winning run financially, but hung around the arcade top 10 list for three years straight in Japan, and also received an extremely varied bunch of arcade ports, which all added to and played to the systems they were on strengths. Formula 1 champion at the time, Ayrton Senna, was apparently a big fan of this game, which no doubt led him to be part of Sega's sequel on all their home consoles in 1992. And Atari were up next with two 3D polygon races, one futuristic in Stun Runner and the other realistic in Hard Driving, plus a traditional overhead racer with a twist in Badlands. And let's start with Stun Runner, a fast-paced 3D polygon racing game on Atari's own hard driving engine. It was a racing destruction game where the goal was simply to survive and get as far as you can within the time limit. You can drive up the walls as well as blast anything that gets in your way. The deluxe arcade version cabinet was modeled after your craft in the game and was really a sight to behold in any arcade at the time. Unique features were the fact that your craft is always going at max speed as there's no acceleration. Avoiding obstacles is the way to keep the pace up. Plus you have shields and the ground is littered with speed boosts. It is in my opinion the game that kicked off the whole 90s futuristic racing trend right into the mainstream with titles from the F-Zero and Wipeout series definitely taking elements from this and making it way more popular. Next was another revolutionary game from Atari at the time, Hard Driving, an extremely realistic driving game in its mechanics with a cool stunt track to race on and full polygon graphics similar to Winning Run. The fact that Namco actually owned Atari games the arcade division in the 80s is the reason Winning Run and this actually exist. They were both working on this together to employ a fast working 3D engine for potential racing games. Namco and Atari eventually parted ways in the late 80s which resulted in them both releasing 3D racing games within months of each other. Winning Run which we looked at earlier was Formula 1 and Hard Driving was more street stunt style. Both were however first person types in nature. In driving you race on a track going over ramps and loops and employed force feedback as well as a fully functioning manual car transmission system with clutch and the works, making the driving feel like a simulator even though the tracks were much more over the top in design. One of my favorite aspects was the instant replay feature which showed your car from an outside 3D view whenever you crashed, giving the game a TV replay kind of feel and would be copied a million times after this in all styles of games. I was absolutely terrible at this game in the arcade and I hadn't learned to drive at that point, so the clutch system was a hard mechanic to wrap my brain around, resulting in many over-revved engine deaths, <laughs> but a friend of mine who had just learned to drive was damn good at it. This game received its arcade sequel in 1990 called Race Driving, and again, like Stun Runner, influenced a whole bunch of 3D style stunt races, like Stunt Driver by Spectrum Alibi and Stunts released by Broderbund, both coming out in 1990. And Atari's last racer went back to their sprint roots with Badlands, a traditional multiplayer overhead style racing destruction game set in a post-apocalyptic future. It was Super Sprint with guns. It was a three-car racing affair where you zoomed around the track littered with hazards, picking up tool icons which could be used later after the race to upgrade your car, plus acquire more powerful weapons like rockets that could take out your opponent with one shot. It featured eight different tracks and wasn't really a big deviation from this style of racer, but its setting and action made it a very memorable game, especially when played against a friend. Leland Corporation also released an overhead multiplayer racer called Super Off-Road, or by its full mouthful title, Arvin Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road. You and two other players could race around the eight tracks in your off-road trucks, which were also kitted out with nitros for quick bursts of speed. You could also pick up cash and bonuses on the course, which could be used later to upgrade your truck between races, much in the vein of Badlands. I used to play this in the arcades all the time with friends. It was a staple of our early 90s arcade experiences. The combination of highly detailed graphics excellent truck physics and the catchy music plus being able to exploit those nitros for some really crazy fast boosting action always made us laugh no matter who won the race in the end it received a ton of home ports and I played my C64 version a lot as practice like I used to do with Shinobi and Silkworm then take those skills to the arcade which secretly gave me the upper hand against my friends and the final racer was Lead Storm by Capcom an overhead racing destruction game known as Mad Gear in Japan which they 
also use this name again as a reference in Final Fight as the name of the main bad guy's punk gang. You race along in these futuristic highways and badlands with the ability to jump over cars and hazards and ram your competition off the road with multiple paths to choose from outrun style. It was fast paced, it was hard, but well made, but still remained pretty obscure upon release. The many home computer ports definitely made this game a bit more memorable to audiences, but it was still mostly forgotten, which is a bit of a pity as it's a great Capcom arcade ROM that is grossly underrated. Now let's go over to the lone versus beat em up game called WWF Superstars by Technos. I remember first playing this in a really dodgy bowling alley in the early 90s. It was sitting next to Pit Fighter and obviously I beelined it for this game of course. The fact that I was a big WWF wrestling fan just added to the game's appeal with its wrestling lineup featuring amongst others Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, the Macho Man Randy Savage and it was a tag team affair with you going up against many other WWF WWF wrestlers of the day, with Andre the Giant being on one of the final boss teams. It used Double Dragon's same graphic style and engine, and featured signature moves from the stars and tons of speech samples and TV style presentation. The game was headed up by Techno's golden boy Yoshihisha Kishimoto, who again made another brawling gem that captured the look and feel of wrestling during this period down to an absolute T, and became the top grossing arcade game by January 1990 in the US, and was followed by WWF WrestleFest in 1991 also by Technos. And the final three games to finish off this decade were a triple threat of classic scrolling hack and slash beat em ups, each one absolutely encompassing this style of game, and are still hard to beat in terms of style and gameplay even to this day. These heavy hitters were Golden Axe by Sega, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by Konami, and Final Fight by Capcom. All three of these games were everywhere during this period, every arcade had them, and they all ended up at some point at my local cafe down the road from me, making playing these games on a regular basis part of my early 90s arcade gaming habit. Let's first check out Sega's hack and slash beat em up Golden Axe, which lets you and a friend choose one of three characters, Axe a barbarian, Gilius an axe wielding dwarf, and Tyrus a female warrior. Each one of them not only being fighters could wield different earth based magic specials, similar to Shinobi, with the exception being you have to collect the magic bottles to unleash them. The amount of magic you have upon using it determines the damage effect. The goal of this fantasy game is to take down Death Adder, a powerful warrior who's taken the king and princess hostage, and now wields their legendary powerful golden axe. The game was designed by Makoto Uchida, who'd done Altered Beast the previous year. He said that Technos were the kings of the urban street thug beat em up, and that going against them was a bad idea, so he decided to set the game in a fantasy setting based on his love of the Conan and the Barbarian movies. You hacked and beat your way through multiple settings like villages, the back of a giant turtle and castles, with bonus stages letting you get extra magic and energy by kicking items out of a bunch of midgets. The ability to ride multiple creatures in the game made it feel like a Dungeons and Dragons game that ticked all the boxes of the time. Wonderful colourful graphics, a memorable soundtrack which I still hum to this day, and good solid sound effects came together for a Sega classic. It received many console based sequels and spin offs, but its true sequel only came in 1992 called Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder in the arcades. Those heroes in a half shell were next with Konami's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, based on the cartoon series that started two years earlier and not the original comic book series. This arcade's timing was absolute perfection, coming out right as the cartoon series had just caught on and Turtle Mania was ramping up all over the world. I never missed an episode of it, and still rank it as one of my favorite Saturday morning cartoons alongside the real Ghostbusters. It was a four player scrolling hack and slash beat em up with you taking the role of one of the four turtles as you attempt to rescue your friend April and your sensei Splinter from Shredder and the evil foot clan of ninjas. The turtles all have their signature weapons with pros and cons for each. Besides kicking and chopping your way through the foot clan, many of the cartoon's villains also make an appearance like Rocksteady and Bebop, Baxter Stockman, Krang and many more. It really tried to give you a playable version of the cartoon and succeeds in every aspect, from the excellent attract screen which replicates the cartoon intro to the fantastic graphics, animation, sound and music. No turtle fan was disappointed at the time. We used to play this a lot. 
In fact, that's an understatement. Being able to have up to four people creating the entire Turtle team on screen at the same time was pretty special. The arcade was a monster hit and became Konami's biggest money maker in the US market ever. It was so popular they actually couldn't produce enough arcades and had to outsource the machine to an extra manufacturer to keep up the demand. The fantastic live action movie also hit cinemas in early 1990 and further boosted the sales and its popularity. And by May 1990 they reportedly had sold over 25,000 cabinets in North America and Europe alone, not counting the rest of the world or Japan. This trilogy of scrolling hack and slash beat em ups in essence kicked off the arcade's resurgence financially but also brought them back into the minds of mainstream popularity. And the final title was by Capcom, their masterpiece scrolling beat em up gem, Final Fight, where you got to choose between the character's Gar, who was a Strider style ninja without a sword, Cody a street brawler, and Hagar a professional wrestler turned the mayor of the dump known as Metro City. Your mission is to rescue Hagar's daughter from the Mad Gear gang and destroy them completely. The game was top quality production values from start to finish, a game running on Capcom's legendary CPS hardware and had another dream team behind the scenes with Okamoto, Yasuda and Matsumi plus many more all working on this game in some sort of capacity. It started life out as a sequel to Street Fighter dubbed Street Fighter 89 but after a few trade shows the feedback was that it played nothing like that original game so Capcom decided to change the title and story giving it its own identity. The game featured six stages slapping your way through the trash house that is Metro City taking out all the levels degenerate Eddie's punks and boss characters. Many of them became so popular that they started showing up in various Street Fighter games as playable characters such as Rolento, Saddam, and poison. Not only could you beat the hell out of everyone, but you could also pick up a host of weapons to crack heads with. It was the most satisfying beat em up I'd ever played up until then. Extremely addictive, with beautiful colorful graphics and awesome sound effects. It was another worldwide hit, just like Turtles, with Capcom selling over 30,000 cabinets worldwide, and the game ranking as the number one money earner by the end of 1990. This game was a staple of my early 90s diet at the time. Like I said earlier, going into any arcade during this period, you could have found either of these three games, or more than likely all of them in most locations. They drew in the crowds and would eventually pave the way for the versus beat em up, which would rule the arcades by the mid 90s. But all of that is another story for another time. And I'll hope you'll join me in the future for part three of this series, the 1990s, which will be ready when it's ready. And that concludes part two. The 1990s will be next, coming soon. And I just want to thank all my guests for their input and help in making this video. Some of them will return in part three and there will also be some new guests. And if you survived this video and are still awake, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'm Bastish B for 64K and I hope you had a good time. If you can please like and subscribe, that will be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.